life and their, and their
Good morning, everybody. It's funny, we had friends staying at the weekend and I was trying to offer them more food and they just weren't as quiet and obedient as that. They just kept on talking. So thank you very much for making my first job of the day so much easier. I'm Catherine Crawford, the Chief Executive at Age Scotland, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all for this, the, Nas the third National Care Services Forum. First of all, a wee bit of housekeeping and then we'll get into the meat of the day. We've got a really great mix of people here at the Science Centre, so thanks so much to all of you for coming along. I know there's a range of backgrounds here, bringing to get together lots of different expertise and personal experience, hopefully making for some very lively and I know extremely important to all of us discussion. We're also joined by many more people who are watching and, and joining in today's event online. Welcome to you all as well. All of us here, whether you're in person or online, has an equally important part to play in the event. We want to have honest, constructive and respectful conversations where we hear each other and think together about what we'd like to see in the future for National Care Service. But before we get into that, I need to cover some housekeeping. If you need first aid, please alert a member of the Glasgow Science Centre staff who can be identified by their blue or green coloured uniforms. Take a sedge step round the room. Some people here are in lovely green tops too, but it's not them, but the Science Centre staff you'll see. And the first aid room is right next door. There's also a quiet room available today. Please ask Glasgow Science Centre staff or a member of the Scottish Government staff who are lots here today to support and help too, if you need to use that room. We've got a very full agenda, but if you want to need, leave the room at any time, please do feel able to do that or stand up and have a stretch, walk around. It's your day. Feel as comfortable as possible so you can get involved in the conversations. No fire alarm planned, so if the alarm does go off, please leave any personal belongings and go calmly to the nearest exit following directions from the Science Centre staff. And of course, the emergency exits are indicated by signs. Everyone should leave by the nearest exit and assemble at the Millennium Square, which is between the Science Centre and the BBC building. I can't point because I've completely lost my sense of direction. Anyway, a little bit from me before we get into the day. So I've worked in the charity sector and with older people for around 20 years in Scotland and across the UK providing and enabling support and influencing and campaigning for change. My very first role was a part-time support worker in Fife, where I live, helping people get access to the support and services that they needed. And working with those families has influenced, I hope, my entire career. So my role now is to represent and amplify the voices of older people right across Scotland through the work that Age Scotland does. We've got three strategic aims, promoting positive views of ageing and later life, tackling loneliness and isolation, and supporting older people to be as well as they can be. You can see right away why a high quality connected care service delivered in the ways that suit each person is of paramount importance. Even more so when you know that there are over 1.1 million people over 65 years old in Scotland today, and that one in six of these older people are already in receipt of a care package. Of course, this is of vital importance today, but also for the future for all of us as our population ages. At Age Scotland, we take our duty to listen to and represent older people's voices very seriously indeed. One of the ways that we engage is through our biannual survey. The research seeks to understand perspectives from older people living in Scotland today. With over 100 questions, you'll understand why we call it the big survey. Well over 4,000 people responded to the 2023 survey, and I thought I'd share a couple of relevant stats here. So a national care service is a broadly popular concept with older people across Scotland. When we asked about it in the big survey, only 10% didn't think it was a good idea. 40% supported it, and 44% they needed to know a wee bit more about it. We also know that improving social care is a top-rated response to the question of how we work together to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow older, our charity's vision. A quarter of older people felt that the top priority for the First Minister should be social care, and it's the second most common issue mentioned in the whole survey. The cost of care is high on people's minds. 74% of older people are concerned about the costs of social care, 
and six in ten felt it should be free to attend day centres that provide social care support. And of course, not be surprised to hear that 81% of people aged over 50 in Scotland are concerned about paying for social care in the future, and I'm definitely including myself in that. Survey results pain to seen, of course, but we're really aware that families struggling with the burden of care may simply not have time to complete a survey. That's why the work that we do to analyse the over 30,000 calls we handle through our helpline every year is so important. We've seen a rise in the number of people calling regarding social care and heard from older people and those closest to them about the issues and challenges they're facing as they try to access care packages. Social care issues are the second most call type to our helpline behind social security matters. Questions about how to pay for care, care options, understanding residential care, getting assessed for care and understanding rights are all too frequent. Far too often people call us after they've had a poor experience of social care, such as having to wait a really long time for care to start, services which aren't available, a lack of local care homes, financial wranglings they're having with local authority. It's clear that the systems as it stands just isn't working for enough people across Scotland. And interspersed with that, I have to say, we do hear some examples of great local practice, so bear that in mind as we think about the future. At Age Scotland 2, we are really glad to support an About Dementia work stream, the Scottish Ethnic Minority Older People's Forum, and a really valuable and growing older people's LGBTQ plus network. Forum members have shared their concerns about accessing care and support and express active concern that communities that have struggled to feel equal in society in the past may become marginalised again as care resources are squeezed. We believe at Age Scotland we must respond to older people's needs and to the issues that people are telling us that matter most. People from all walks of life struggle to find their way through their local care systems. Therefore, we as a charity feel we have to do more to support. As a result, we're redesigning our advice services and strengthening our advocacy work so that we can stand by older people for longer as they push to access the support they need to receive the care and support they deserve. We're keen to make sure that older people's voices are heard and fully involved in the debates, plans and ultimately delivery of reform of social care. But that must be tempered with understanding that people are frustrated and weary with the pace of change. And for people with current direct lived experience, time to get involved with influencing change can be a real challenge. Developing creative and meaningful ways of doing this as the work to reform goes forward will make a huge difference. Our evidence shows that care provisions vary from local authority to local authority, town to town, and as one caller from the Highlands told us, depends whether you're living on the carer's daily route or not. Older people say that they want, wherever possible, to live independently at home for as long as possible with accessible, affordable care. Understanding how to access a social care system is vital, as is a system that works seamlessly between hospital and home. From their perspectives, deep-rooted reform is urgent and essential to deliver the changes that people need and deserve, and investment into that reform is crucial. I know that all of us here today have an understanding of the challenges and complexities of delivering reform of this kind in an existing system. Layering that with the real and challenging budget pressures we all face brings added pressure too. Hearing the voice of people in need of care now and those who may need it in the future will help to support good decision making as commissioners balance the vital importance of delivering person-centred, equitable and high quality services to individuals alongside the cost benefits of doing so. There's no doubt to us at Sage Scotland that we need to fix social care and to reform a system that's under extraordinary pressure. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions today as we work together to develop thinking and the proposals and hope by the end of the day that the highly experienced and skilled people taking part have had a chance to share their wisdom and experience and that the government can use those experiences to further develop our thinking. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, Neil Gray, to the stage as our first speaker of the day. Neil, welcome.
Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for uh, welcoming us and for uh, kicking off the day. I, I had a fantastic opportunity to visit Aid Scotland uh, in the summer to um, see their incredible work, uh, the work of their helpline staff, uh, but also uh, their dementia team. And it was amazing to see the progress uh, that is being made in enhancing support for those living uh, with dementia. And I'm delighted that they're with us today, sharing the knowledge and experience. So thank you, Catherine. Uh, the energy in the room, the, the, the buzz is uh, palpable. Uh, and so I'm uh, really delighted uh, to be here uh, today, to be involved in today's event. And we know that social care is a vital service, that it helps people live their lives as they want to, honours their human rights, uh, allows people to live in or close to their own homes and supports health and well-being for many of the most vulnerable people in our society. And this uh, is important to everyone in Scotland. And that's why we collectively invest around £5 billion a year in social care. All across Scotland, uh, I and uh, Minister for Social Care, Marie Todd, uh, regularly hear examples of how essential that investment is, where the support offered through those services is truly life-changing. So many people help uh, to access uh, that, uh, and uh, it's important that it's essential to their well-being, their dignity, and their independence. But we know that uh, for some people, they do not get the support that they need or the service that they should expect. And we've heard time and again that things need to change. Things need to improve. Social care reform is one of the most important challenges this government and many other governments are facing. People want and need services delivered in a way that best suits their needs, builds on their strengths, and makes sure that they can live their lives well. The Feely Review reinforced this and brought home the importance of people putting people at the heart of reform. We have a responsibility to deliver meaningful change to the people of Scotland. And I say we advisedly. Of course it is government's responsibility to lead uh, on this change, on this reform. But we all in this room and beyond have agency, have a responsibility uh, to deliver that change. And that's why working with and listening to people with lived experience has been so vital in the work we've done together to design the National Care Service. Those who experience the system firsthand are the real experts. And it's crucial that they play a role in the accountability and oversight of the way we develop the social care, social work and community health services in Scotland. You've told us that the current system is not transparent. People find it hard to understand what help is on offer and how to access it. And there is a huge variation in the services available in different parts of the country, as Catherine referenced in her speech, and to different uh, groups of people. You've told us that it's not clear who is accountable for the services available and who can take action when improvement is needed. The pandemic has highlighted that people hold Scottish ministers accountable for social care. That's not unreasonable given the large amounts of public funding allocated to social care and its importance in people's lives. And that's why progressing with the National Care Service Bill is so important and why we are committed to, to doing it. The recent expert legislative advisory group uh, said that many, of the, that many of you took part in uh, helped us shape that draft amendments to that bill uh, and helped us to move forward. The group made it clear that people have a wide range of opinions. Uh, we will not always reach consensus, but it is important to have the opportunity to hear from all perspectives. And there are different viewpoints and there are disagreements, but that's okay. The one thing I don't hear anyone arguing for is the status quo. We know that uh, we, we know we can make changes voluntarily within the existing system and we've started to do that, but sustainable and long-term reform requires legislative change. The draft amendments are currently making their th way through committee and parliament, uh, and many of you will have had the opportunity to respond to the call for evidence on those. So thank you again for engaging and sharing your views. We've committed to listen carefully to what we've been told, and we are working closely with the parliament during this stage of the bill. But the NCS is much more than just the bill. There are other things that we've already been making progress with uh, alongside. Uh, one impact of the current challenges facing the health and social care system is people who are unable to leave hospital 
because there is not suitable support in place at home or in the community. It's critical that people have the opportunity and the support to live well in their communities. Improving the care and experience for adults with incapacity it is a priority and it's unacceptable that people are spending time in hospitals or in other care settings when they are medically fit for discharge. Although we have made some recent progress through ongoing work to reform the Adults with Incapacity Act, there is more to be done. We know that the current system isn't working and delayed discharges are a symptom of wider system failures. The number of delayed discharges in some local authority areas is 10 times the rate than in others. And that's why the national mission has been established jointly between the Scottish Government and COSLA to tackle delayed discharge. Alongside this, we are providing targeted support to local systems on AWI delays through Healthcare Improvement Scotland. The delayed discharge mission and improving experiences for adults with incapacity are key strands in our overall approach to reducing delays and across the health service, improving matters for people. So I want to reaffirm to you all that our focus here is on ensuring that people have uh, able to access the care system uh, and can do so within their own communities. We're working closely with local partners through existing structures to try and tackle this issue. And while I'm grateful for their collective work to address delayed discharge, this is the type of targeted effort on a single issue and it is not a systematic uh, approach. A, a national care service will allow us to address this kind of disparity in care support across the country on a wide range of issues. Improving the care and experience for adults with incapacity is a priority for me. It's a priority for this government. And it's unacceptable that people are spending time in hospitals or other care settings when they are fit for discharge. Although we have made some recent progress, for example, through ongoing work to reform the AWI Act, I believe there's further improvements that can be made. So to support this through the Collaborative Response and Assurance Group that we chair alongside COSLA to drive down delayed discharge, we are providing targeted support to local systems on AWI delays through Healthcare Improvement Scotland. The Delayed Discharge Mission, Home First, Improving Experiences for Adult with Incapacity and our key strands in our overall approach to reducing delays and across the healthcare system. And that's why we will keep working across the sectors, across the systems, to ensure we support people as best we can. Pay in the social care sector is an important area where we've been able to make some progress. And it's timely that this event is taking place at the start of Child Poverty Week. A key priority of this government is to tackle the harm caused to children through being born into poverty, something no child in Scotland should uh, have to suffer. Fair work is one of the most important things we can do to help tackle poverty. People working in good jobs, with good terms and conditions, earning enough money to support themselves and their families is what uh, will help make our communities thrive. The social care workforce in Scotland is 80% female, and the aver average age of those working in private care is 41. We know that child poverty is intrinsically linked to female poverty, so that by paying our social care workforce a more competitive wage that they deserve, we can help tackle the child poverty gap. Minimum wages are an important way of supporting people in the workforce, stimul uh, stimulating economic growth and reducing uh, the children's uh, poverty gap. Uh, enabling and supporting parents to increase their income through paid work and earnings is an important part of tackling child poverty. It's not a silver bullet, but it's an important way of improving access routes and removing barriers to employment. Increased earnings can also alleviate financial stress for parents, which can have positive effects on parenting, family dynamics, leading to a better environment for children. Uh, the Labour Party across the UK have uh, included uh, introducing a national care service in their manifesto uh, and recently talked about improving pay and conditions for staff uh, as a first step. The Scottish Government has been committed to increasing workers' pay to at least the real living wage since 2016. And earlier this month, we committed to prioritising funding to increase the pay of workers in uh, the adult and children's social care uh, who are delivering direct care and commission services so they will continue to receive at least the real living wage uh, from April 25. The Scottish Government is proud to have led the way in increasing enhanced minimum hourly rates of pay for the adult social care workforce amongst the four UK nations, but we know we have more work to do. 
The paid workforce is an essential part of our social care uh, system, but we also know that so much of the support that people need is provided by unpaid carers. The National Care Service will also strengthen support for unpaid carers to ensure they can access the financial and emotional support that they might need. The National Care Service Bill will also establish a right to breaks for unpaid carers. Better support for carers will also improve educational outcomes for young carers and help parent carers balance employment and caring, helping address child poverty, benefiting the wider economy, supporting people to live well. The experiences and outcomes for people who use social care support and community health, unpaid carers and the workforce is critical and people have been absolutely clear that they expect all of us to work together to achieve improvement. That's why we have co-developed with COSLA and SOLAS the Scottish Learning and Improvement Framework for Adult Social Care and Community Health. This framework sets out the vision and priorities for improvement in adult social care support, social work and community health, moving from predominantly focusing on scrutiny and measuring performance to an approach that builds improvement and quality management into the system. Alongside this, to ensure improvement is driven by a clear and consistent set of standards across the system, we've begun a review of the he uh, current health and social care standards. These two pieces of work will be crucial in delivering better outcomes for everyone who uses health, social care or social work services in Scotland. Over the last two years, we've invested a huge amount of time and energy into improving the data we collect and review on health and social care. This has led to a detailed understanding of performance and level of variation, which we together can address. This includes data on delayed discharges, which tells us not just the national picture, but also allows us to understand where outcomes are different across the country. To put it bluntly, there is no reason why someone in, for example, Highland has a very different experience to someone living in South Ayrshire when they're all ready to leave hospital but need a social care package or placement. The work in our social care data and intelligence programme has also been improving outcomes for the people of Scotland by optimising the development and analysis of social care data. With the support from the sector, we've also made changes to tourist care management to reduce the burden on care homes. And the work that we have done on data has allowed us to put in place the support that best helps local systems to meet the challenges and represents an important transitionary step as we move towards a national care service. One critical change that I want to see through the National Care Service is ensuring that the real experts, those who have first-hand experience of how systems operate, the people who receive uh, care, are central to our scrutiny of performance and that lived experience remains the golden thread running through our reforms. The National Care Service will ensure greater transparency in the delivery uh, and, uh, of care with greater accountability at national and local level while strengthening the role of the workforce and providing enhanced support for unpaid carers. To put it simply, we simply can't afford not to do this. Around 234,000 people, one in 25 of us, currently receive social care services and or support in Scotland. Uh, with our ageing population, those figures are set to increase. And the latest figures in Scotland's census shows an estimated total of around 696,000 people, that is around one in eight of us, providing unpaid care and support to people across Scotland. It's not an exaggeration to say that at some point in everyone's lives, they are likely to be impacted uh, by the social care system. Whether it's because we need support ourselves, caring for a child with disabilities, ensuring the best possible care is in place for elderly relatives, or many other situations where someone we love needs help. So to close, the people in this room know we can do better. And the fact that there are hundreds of us here gathered today to discuss how we do that is something to celebrate. I certainly do. Times are tough and finances are tight, but now is not the time to get smaller. We need to elevate our thinking and focus on our ambition. I know that the National Care Service Bill has proved to be a challenging piece of legislation. It certainly felt that over the last few weeks. But often the most successful policies are. Change is difficult and necessary. The challenge for all of us is whether we're ambitious enough to deliver. Not for ourselves, not to protect what has always been, but to deliver for others, to deliver for those who receive and work in social care. 
We want to continue to engage with local government on the National Care Service. The door is open for us to work constructively through continued progress on the National Care Service Bill. We all have agency in this process. We all have a voice and we should all be listened to. I'd like to ask all of you here today and watching online to use your voice to help us drive forward progress within the social care sector and the National Care Service. Tell us why it is important to you. Push for us all to deliver for you and the people that you represent. We want to keep hearing from you, working with you to make the National Care Service work for generations to come. This is our chance to make a real significant difference. It is hard, of course it is, it's taking time, but that is because we need to get this right. The birth of the NHS was hard, but it's now a national treasure. In 76 years time, what do we want people to say about the National Care Service? High quality community health and social care support helps create thriving communities and a thriving economy across Scotland. We need to tackle the inconsistency of care provision across the country. It's also vital, it also has vital connections to other parts of the public sector. It's important that we work together to support people in a holistic way, to manage risk and harm across all of our public services. They must work to remove barriers, tackle inequalities and allow people to flourish and live their lives as they want to. The work that we are doing to honour what is in the Feely Review is so important. What really matters is people who use services and social work and social care staff. So we are committed to providing better, more consistent standards across the country. We want to change the system from one that supports people to survive to one that empowers them to thrive with human rights at its heart. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your support and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks so much, Cabinet Secretary. And I think we've got time for a few yes. questions, haven't we? So, yes, from the floor. I'm not sure how the miking will work, so I think I may have to repeat back to the floor of the question. Here's a mic coming. Yep. We've got about 10 minutes, just to be clear. Hello, Dr. Caroline Gold, Isle of Skye, so in the Highlands. Um, you said that you wanted to be putting people with lived experience at the heart of reform, but you're not giving them, them the right to needs satisfaction. We are the experts, you said, so why not give us the right to live as we want to, equally and with equality in our society? We will never achieve that if we rely on social workers who make decisions for us without actually discussing them very often with us. We have a right to needs satisfaction and that is what we want along with our human rights that we do not achieve. And just in case you're unaware, I'm an unpaid carer 24 seven for my husband against my wishes because he simply can't get his personal care needs met in terms of they're not giving him the money he's due because of only offering it through one system to him, which he has sought legal advice on and had been advised that if somebody from the NHS decides the money has built up too high in the advanced card payment scheme, then he uh, will have it removed. And if that person removes it into their own bank account, my husband would be legally liable and we were advised not to sign the contract. And so far we have been told there is no alternative. There is an alternative because I'm on it. Thanks very much indeed, Caroline, um, for so powerfully setting out why we need change within uh, the social care system within Scotland. And I don't deny the challenges that you're, you're facing. My father also receives social care. I've got other family members who are in receipt of social care. And the empowerment for my father is self-directed support. And I recognise that self-directed support um, works differently across different parts of the country and getting a better consistency about how that is applied and, and the true empowerment of the people that are in receipt of social care is so important. And I don't pretend that, that all of that gets resolved through a national care service, but I do think that that is a step in the way of getting an improvement in the situation. Um, and uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, uh, in terms of getting to the, the right to needs satisfaction, uh, I recognise is critically important, not just for those that are in receipt, 
of uh, social care, but those that are currently, like yourself, providing the care uh, for a loved one, uh, uh, perhaps because there is no other uh, care uh, available. Uh, so, Indeed, uh, and, and um, my, my family um, also live in an island community, so I recognise the additional challenge that there is there um, when we're living in uh, rural or island communities and having access to choice um, is, is a challenge. So that's why we need to continue to invest and enhance the social care offering to make sure that we continue to allow people to live well, both those that are working either on a paid or unpaid basis or indeed in receipt of social care. Thank you, Neil. There's a lady at the front here. <coughs> um, just while we wait. Do you want to ask, because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Well, here we go. Here's the mic. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your um, notes this morning. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear the updates. Um, I work in Highland as well, and in Argyll and View, in one role, and across Scotland in another. In 2014, we had a fantastic opportunity that lots of people had hope for serious change, and that was through the self-directed support legislation, within which are the values and principles of self-directed support, which were co-designed with people with lived experience. What's going to be different this time around? If we haven't managed to embed those principles now, what will be different? And secondly, why does it feel like self-directed support is an add-on to the National Care Service Bill so far? Why isn't it a golden thread, using one of your terms, um, of, of, of a way of implementing true human, a true human rights-based approach to social care? Thank you very much. I didn't catch your name. Yes, it's Bex Barker. Bex Barker. Bex, thank you, Bex. Um, and, and thank you for your work in, in, in Highland and in, um, Argyll and Butte and across Scotland. I think um, I've already set out the importance to me uh, that SDS plays because uh, having a, a system that allows my father to have choice around how he is cared for uh, and how he lives his life is, is critically important. But I recognise that that uh, works for my dad in Orkney. It doesn't necessarily work in all uh, local authority areas. And I, as a constituency MSP, uh, often receive uh, queries upon this. And in response to Caroline, uh, as in response to you, I recognise that there is an inconsistency there. A national care service is about providing greater consistency, both for those who live and are in receipt uh, of uh, those who need social care, uh, but also who work in social care. It's about providing a, a better standard. And it's about continuing the progress that we have started. So the 2014 reforms it started a journey that I believe a, a, a national care service helps us to complete. The integration journey that we're on, a national care, care service is about helping to us to complete that. Uh, and in terms of how um, the national care service currently is the bill is currently instituted. Of course, it's a framework bill, so some of the details uh, around how it actually will work in practice will need to come through uh, thereafter. But I think having, uh, I've already set out the, the basic principles around what we're wanting a national care service to do, and I don't think that are actually specs far away from what you're asking us for to deliver. Great. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Now, I think already time has galloped on, so there's a lady over here, um, Yvonne, if you could just go over the lady spectacles on and very smiling face um, over here and a gentleman over here oh different lady <laughs> sorry sorry I'm happy to take the questions that I oh, think I'll, kinda, I'll maybe try and gather up two or three would it help to take two or three yes, questions two, at two, two, once two, and yeah. then so I'm a bit concerned about um, SDS meaning for many people SDS option one and I wondered, I think the, the principles of self-directed support are very valid. I think the route to actually achieve it is what we need to be looking at. The structures rather than just the person who delivers the message about it. How will the National Care Service ensure personalization and good service for all, not just the people who manage to get option one one, because their area is better at it, or two, because they have a business background or somebody in their family that can do that. So I think we have to be very sure that we have personalisation for all and not just option one personalisation. Great, How will we thank get you. It? 
Thank you. And the lady behind um, Yvonne, if that's okay, could you stick your hand up there? Great, thank you. And if you try to be succinct with the question, that will help us get so, through a few more. Um, and I'll come to this gentleman here. Mine kind of falls on from that. I heard you mention about the status quo. I have been delivering training as somebody with lived experience of learning and physical disability since I was the age of 18. And I believe that people with um, lived experience have tried to push the status quo for many, many years, and we're still fighting for that. So I, I didn't understand where you came from when you were saying that um, people have been not talking about the status quo when we have for quite a number of years. And I'll, if that's all right, Cabinet Secretary, take one more. This gentleman in the front, and I think in the interest of time, if you shout your question, and I'll repeat it back to the floor. Oh, it's another mic just behind us. Great. Hello, Neil. Um, I've got two parts to this question. One is you've done very well to get uh, facilities in point Orkins. I'm uh, part of a group called Poverty Alliance, mm -hmm. and the situation in coal is untenable. That's the first part. The second part is a negative thing, unfortunately, and that is I've read in the papers recently that Kosler rejected uh, the suggestions of the National Care Service and that the GMB, uh, who are probably the union that are most involved in providing care, have also rejected it. Now, that's, that's Kosler, the trade union, combining to be negative. Sorry, but you've got a big job, but I'll help you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm glad that we've turned to that, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover Stephen's question uh, there uh, at the end. First of all, in, in terms of um, self-directed support from the lady around option one not being for everyone, um, I think is important to set out, and uh, the importance of personalisation and giving people choice through uh, social care is critically important and has to be about what we do with the National Care Service, is if it's to succeed uh, and if we're to honour what Feely set out. Um, I, I recognise that uh, my, my, my dad's fortunate not just to be able to uh, utilise self-directed support, but that uh, his choice of managing his own care package is one that he's happy with. I've got plenty of constituents who uh, want the choice, but don't want to be involved in, in running their care package uh, for themselves. So I recognise that there is, is, and there are plenty of organisations out there that can help uh, in that process, but I recognise that uh, personalisation is going to be fundamentally important, and if we're to honour Feely, it has to come through. Um, in terms of the status quo, uh, the, the point that I was making there is I don't think anyone was arguing for the position that we're currently in to be the position that we have going forward, uh, where we have gaps in provision, gaps in service, an inconsistency in service delivery, um, and uh, different parts of the country uh, being able to enjoy uh, services that aren't enjoyed elsewhere. I want to bring everybody up. I want to bring everybody up in terms of the care that is afforded, but also uh, the way it's delivered, so that we're, we're supporting those who work in uh, social care better, uh, but we're also delivering better for those who receive social care. Uh, and um, the point that I was making about nobody uh, arguing for the status quo comes me on, comes, uh, brings me on to Stephen's question uh, about uh, where uh, COSLA and uh, our trade union colleagues are. I recognise that there are difference, uh, differences of opinion uh, in terms of uh, the National Care Service. Uh, and I respect the fact uh, that there are strongly held views in local government and within the trade union movement. I absolutely respect that. Um, I want us to get back around the table and to discuss those areas of concern uh, and to move forward because I think we've all got a responsibility, whether we're in government, whether we're in local government, whether we're uh, in the trade union movement, to be delivering for the people who receive social care. And currently, I think it's fair to say that collectively uh, we're not doing enough in that regard and we've got a room for improvement. So where there's room for improvement, we've got a responsibility, as I said in our speech, to leave behind our um, uh, personal or our organisational uh, 
uh, biases, come together and do what is in the best interests of people, whether that's people working in health and social care or people who are in receipt of it. And I believe there is still room for negotiation, for discussion and compromise in order to move forward so that we can deliver a national care service. That's my ambition. It's the ambition of government. Um, and I'm, I hope we can all rise to that challenge for the points that you're making, Stephen, in terms of the availability of service in different parts of the country, but also for what I've heard from colleagues uh, around the room today, uh, that it's important that we deliver upon this. So that's my, that, uh, that's my offer. Uh, and I'm, my, the, the door is open for myself, for Marie, uh, from government uh, to move forward. And uh, I would encourage uh, those that you've mentioned to take that opportunity. Great, thank I think you. there was another lady Yes, over another here. lady um, with white tea. We've got time. I'm just saying it's 25 to 2 now. Have you got another okay. couple of minutes? So, um, Take two, more with flight, two, two more questions. Two, two more Great. questions, then I'll run. Um, I used to work in a, a care home in Inverness, and I was starting to become disabled. Um, I had a lot of discriminatory behaviour towards me because I was disabled, because I was deemed less than, because I was unable to do the work. And I've continued to have that dis dis um, discrimination from that because then became disabled, a carer for my husband. And all I have seen within the workplace, from agencies, from everywhere, is discrimination yeah. from carers, from within the workplace, and seen as less than because I am disabled. I am a carer for my husband who's, who's disabled. And yes, I can understand there's no money, there's no stuff, there's nothing there. But all I've seen is discrimination. And the very last question, a lady down at the front of the table two, please. Oh, we've lost our other mic. Sorry. Uh, for colleagues uh, around the room who, who didn't catch that last question, it was about uh, care being afforded and the interaction of the budget um, at the end of the month. Um, I, I'm very sorry about your experience about um, uh, being uh, discriminated against because of your disability. There is no place for discrimination uh, in the workplace or in other, any other se uh, sector. Um, and um, obviously, I, I don't know your specific circumstances in terms of how that could be improved, but I, I would uh, want to see, you know, whether it's a national care service, whether it's any other uh, reform or change, to make sure that that is inclusive change, to make sure that people are included, whether they're working in social care or whether they're in receipt of social care, uh, and that we're doing it on a needs-based um, uh, basis, uh, aligned to what the lady over here was asking for, which was a personalisation uh, for all. So I think uh, uh, the, the points that you're making uh, are well made. In terms of um, the importance of the UK budget at the end of the month, uh, it's not a political statement to say that decisions that are taken at Westminster have a fundamental bearing upon decisions that we're able to take uh, at Holyrood and thereby extension uh, decisions that are taken in uh, local government uh, as well. So of course uh, the decisions that are taken at the end of this month uh, by Rachel Reeves are going to have a bearing in terms of uh, how or how to what extent we're able to invest in public services. Of course, my more political statement is of course I would encourage the end of, its, of austerity. Austerity has diminished public services across the UK over the last decade and a half. Uh, part of the reason we're feeling the pressure that we are across social care uh, is because of that, not just uh, because of austerity, but the impact that Brexit has had on removing uh, a, a large proportion of our social care workforce who were from uh, continental Europe uh, and chose to return uh, after Brexit and the way that we handled that situation. Uh, so I would want to see uh, an investment, a valuing of public services uh, above uh, the um, economic narrative that we have seen over the last decade and a half. We need to move away from that. The importance of our public services to our economy 
it is absolutely fundamental. The two are absolutely, the, the, the two sides of the same coin. You cannot have a strong economy without thriving public services. You cannot have a thriving public services without a strong economy. You need to invest in both. Uh, and uh, that's what I hope we will see at the end of this month. Um, and obviously we'll be taking decisions around our own budget and the implication that has going forward um, uh, later in the year after we've understood the implication of uh, the decisions that are taken on the 30th of October. Uh, I hope it's uh, more treat than trick for a Halloween budget. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really sorry, I don't think the Minister has any time for further questions this morning, but thank you so much for the questions you put. And thank you so much, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you all. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks so much for that first very interesting first session. It's my pleasure now to introduce Donna Bell, the Director for Social Care and NCS Development Directorate at Scottish Government. Donna's going to set the scene for our session ahead. Donna. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome. Delighted to be here today and to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I'm very conscious that that was a popular Q&A session with the Cabinet Secretary, so not everyone had the opportunity to have their question answered, uh, particularly those online. So we will make sure that we get to those questions and make sure you get a response to those. So here we are for the third forum, um, an event that um, has become a tradition and one that I look forward to. Um, it's a really good chance for us to take stock and to reflect um, and an important opportunity for us to get around the table um, and have more detailed discussions about how we can continue to build the National Care Service. Mm -hmm. Firstly, before I um, say a little more, um, the First Minister also sends his best wishes today. Um, he's not able to be with us, he's in Shetland today. But we do have a short video message from him reiterating his support for the National Care Service. I've heard time and again of the wonderful, life-changing care and support that people receive from our social care workforce. I also know that the system needs to work for everyone. It needs to reflect the Scotland of today. The National Care Service is our chance to fundamentally transform the way social care is delivered in Scotland. It will only work if we put people at the heart of the system. We've listened to the thousands of you who have given us your views. Thank you for sharing your time. You've already made a tremendous difference. You've told us the principles that are important to you and we will make that change happen. We will ensure greater transparency in the delivery of care. We will ensure greater accountability at a national and a local level. We will strengthen the role of the workforce and provide enhanced support for unpaid carers. We owe it to this and future generations to develop a social care system that we are all proud of. The National Care Service is our way to do that. So the First Minister obviously extends his thanks to all of you for your contributions and we would like to share um, those thanks with you. Um, We've already got strong foundations to build on. We've got the Self-Directed Support Act, um, Bex has already mentioned that, and the good practice that exists. We've got the Carers Act and the Carers Strategy um, well underway. And we've already talked about uh, support and service integration through integration joint boards. And there has been feedback that we'll lose progress in some of these areas, but I just want to say that is absolutely not the, the intention here. These are the fundamental building blocks of the National Care Service. And what we really want to do, and CABSEC talked about this, is embed them really firmly in the NCS as that golden thread and focus on implementation and on consistency. So, so far this year, since the uh, last forum, the people in this room, the people on Ryan, online and many others have been able to give um, a huge amount of influence in the development of the NCS and also um, quite a significant impact on how policy has developed. So you and others have contributed so far to the development of the principles, to the development of the national board, 
to the first Charter of Rights as a very tangible example. And you can see the Charter in draft at the Charter stall, either at lunchtime or at the end of the day, and we can make that available. We've had great conversations on sectoral bargaining and on collective voice, both of which have made really, really great progress. We've talked about complaints and redress and completed a large part of the co-design work on that, uh, on independent advocacy as well. Um, we've had hugely productive conversations. And then slightly separate to the development of the work on the National Care Service, but absolutely integral, is that point about personalisation. We've been doing um, a lot of really, really good work on getting it right for everyone, which is about personalisation. Um, and pathfinders across the country are starting to demonstrate really good progress there too. So the next session is about rights and equalities. And we want to hear from you about the serious issues that affect people. And we've already begun to hear about those today from the people in this room. Um, in a really compelling way. And we want to hear more about those issues. What we need to think about as we develop policy, and importantly, what we think the solutions are. So through the forum and through the ongoing co-design, we can keep working together to build the National Care Service. And we can't do that without you. So we look forward to today and to the ongoing engagement with you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have till half past 12 for you to get into the interact the conversations at your table, whether it's in the room or online. Um, I kind of think if you, we've got 45 minutes, so you can divide up the questions and work out how much per question in your own tables. Um, the facilitators are there, obviously, to support you with discussions and note takers, and everything you say will be fed back in to Scottish Government as they develop their policies. Thank you. You've just popped back in. Are you all right there? Are you looking for a breakout room?
Hi, everybody. Um, everybody here and everybody in online, certainly in the room here, it feels like conversations are still going on at pace. But I've just got to say, just a couple of minutes now till lunchtime to refuel for the afternoon ahead. So um, please do wrap up your conversations. Make sure your facilitators um, and note takers have got all the information you want to get across. Um, the lunch, I think, is in the room. Just let me check, just to look along to the right in the Clyde suite. Um, I think it would make self sense if we can self organize a little bit um, and we'll maybe just do it the easiest way. So, if the first table, number one table, could kind of head off quickly and number two, number three, just follow on, use yourself so that the queues don't get too big. Please, could you make sure you're back and sit it down by about. 25 past one, and we're looking forward to the afternoon. Just one more thing before we break. Um, if you're not able or don't feel like going along for lunch, we can bring it to you. There's menus on the table, and Science Centre staff and Scottish Government staff are here to support and help. So enjoy lunch. Thank you. in, in that. That they that they used to um, engage in, and that clearly has a, a detrimental effect on their life and their and their quality of life. But we also know from research that having fewer social contacts can increase the risk of subsequently developing dementia. So actually, maintaining these these social contacts is is protective, is really helpful for somebody's health. One way that you could help them is, is not to be embarrassed about, about keeping in touch with them and, and asking about how they're doing, encouraging them to, to keep active, encouraging them to keep socially engaged and to, to keep up the links that they've, they've already always had, or even start new things and to join new communities. When I see somebody in, in clinic, it's always with a, with a care partner, often a family member or a close friend. So as well as looking out for your friends and relatives who have dementia themselves, the people supporting them need their own support and need help maintaining their own social contact. Stay connected to them, to be there, to be part of their lives and to keep being involved. So, living with dementia for me, in my experience, is a bit of a mixed bag. I wanted to continue to work and try to do that, but that didn't work, so I lost my job. I lost my driver's licence. I lost a lot of friends and colleagues. But it is a mixed bag because I've also gained and made so many different improvements in my life because I've made new friends, I've made new connections, I've learned a whole load of new skills that I never thought I would be able to learn. My immediate family have been amazing around the house and in the garden and so on. The physical adaptions, there's a ramp in the garden now instead of the stairs. My friends are also marvellous. So if we're going out, they'll message or call that day, remind me of the time, remind me of the place, remind me if I need to take a gift or if I have to take money to pay for something. If I'm not really wanting to go out, because socially it can be tricky to go out sometimes, they keep it flexible and they keep it, you know, just so that it's within my comfort zone. I am a founder member of a peer support group here in Fife called STAND. We have cognitive activities like songwriting, arts and craft, lots and lots of different things that you can do and just be socially connected with people who are like you but different. So one of my favourite things to do is to be walking. I have a wee dog and we're out walking all the time. And I find that really helps me to get out the house. But it's also a marvellous connection with the community. 
because when you're out walking, people stop and they chat to you. So I find that keeps me really connected with the world around me.
leveller and if people can find a game that they can all play, I think it's a really good thing. It's the same person uh, and although they may have problems with organisation or short-term memory, they still have the same relationship with you. When I first heard it was dementia, I was floored. I stopped talking this much. Stop doing the things I used to. I was acting differently. None of these people have dementia. They are the friends and family of people who do. Steve just being himself again made all the difference to me, even if he does act the clown. When a friend or relative is first diagnosed with dementia, it's natural not to know what to do, but helping someone stay connected and socially active can help them stay well for longer. It's time to rethink dementia. Following a diagnosis of dementia, it's really important that people engage socially to maintain their quality of life, to maintain a support structure around them during a, a, a challenging time in, in their life. My name's Tom Russ. I am an old age psychiatrist, which means I'm a doctor that, that looks after people who have dementia. Um, and I have the privilege of spending half my time working clinically in the NHS, but I also spend half my time on research. There are a couple of ways that um, social contact is important in relation to somebody who, who, who might be developing dementia. The first is that, that very often we see people disengaging from social contacts that they, that they used to um, engage in, and that clearly has a, a detrimental effect on their life and their, and their quality of life. But we also know from research that having fewer social contacts can increase the risk of subsequently developing dementia. So actually maintaining these, these social contacts is, is protective, is really helpful for somebody's health. One way that you could help them is, is not to be embarrassed about, about keeping in touch with them and, and asking about how they're doing, encouraging them to, to keep active, encouraging them to keep socially engaged and to, to keep up the links that they've, they've already always had or even start new things and to join new communities. When I see somebody in, in clinic, it's always with a, with a care partner, often a family member or a close friend. So as well as looking out for your friends and relatives who have dementia themselves, the people supporting them need their own support and need help maintaining their own social contact. stay connected to them, to be there, to be part of their lives and to keep being involved. So, living with dementia for me, in my experience, is a bit of a mixed bag. I wanted to continue to work and try to do that, but that didn't work, so I lost my job. I lost my driver's licence. I lost a lot of friends and colleagues, but it is a mixed bag because I've also gained and made so many different improvements in my life because I've made new friends, I've made new connections, I've learned a whole load of new skills that I never thought I would be able to learn. My immediate family have been amazing around the house and in the garden and so on. The physical adaptions, there's a ramp in the garden now instead of the stairs. My friends are also marvellous. So if we're going out, they'll message or call that day, remind me of the time, remind me of the place, remind me if I need to take a gift or if I have to take money to pay for something. If I'm not really wanting to go out, because socially it can be tricky to go out sometimes, they keep it flexible and they keep it, you know, just so that it's within my comfort zone. I am a founder member of a peer support group here in Fife called STAND. We have cognitive activities like songwriting, arts and craft, lots and lots of different things that you can do and just be socially connected with people who are like you but different. So one of my favourite things to do is to be walking. I have a wee dog and we're out walking all the time. Now I find that really helps me to get out the house but it's also a marvellous connection with the community because when you're out walking people stop and they chat to you. So I find that keeps me really connected with the world around me.
the more social interaction you have and the more positive it is, the more rich and fulfilled your life is. Well, my wife had noticed, I mean, she has expertise in dementia from her professional life, and she had noticed some years ago that I was having problems uh, cognitively and memory-wise. And as a result of her encouragement, uh, I self-referred. They did a scan of my brain and discovered that large parts of it were no longer there. <laughs> um, which is the cause of my dementia. But the main support's from Joan, my wife, um, who is always very keen to keep me organised uh, and busy. I mean, I'm retired now, so there's obviously, uh, life is much easier than it used to be in many respects. Um, but I go out to the pub and meet friends regularly once a week. I, you know, do a lot of walking, I do a lot of reading. We're very busy with the grandchildren, so yeah, um, all these things are good. I actually made friends with somebody. We've become very close, and um, we now play we play canasta with them as a couple every week, every Sunday evening. It's just a routine, and it's really annoying because Danny nearly always wins. He's so good at it. Um, but it's it's a great leveller, and if people can find a game that they can all play, I think it's a really good thing. It's the same person, uh, and although they may have problems with organisation or short-term memory, they still have the same relationship with you. When I first heard it was dementia, I was floored. I stopped talking this much. Stop doing the things I used to. I was acting differently. None of these people have dementia. They are the friends and family of people who do. Steve just being himself again made all the difference to me, even if he does act the clown. When a friend or relative is first diagnosed with dementia, it's natural not to know what to do, but helping someone stay connected and socially active can help them stay well for longer. It's time to rethink dementia. Following a diagnosis of dementia, it's really important that people engage socially to maintain their quality of life, to maintain a support structure around them during a, a, a challenging time in, in their life. My name's Tom Russ, I am an old age psychiatrist, which means I'm a doctor that, that looks after people who have dementia. Um, and I have the privilege of spending half my time working clinically in the NHS, but I also spend half my time on research. There are a couple of ways that um, social contact is important in relation to somebody who, who, who might be developing dementia. The first is that, that very often we see people disengaging from social contacts that they, that they used to um, engage in. And that clearly has a, a detrimental effect on their life and their, and their quality of life. But we also know from research that having fewer social contacts can increase the risk of subsequently developing dementia. So actually maintaining these, these social contacts is, is protective, is really helpful for somebody's health. One way that you could help them is, is not to be embarrassed about, about keeping in touch with them and, and asking about how they're doing encouraging them to, to keep active, encouraging them to keep socially engaged and to, to keep up the links that they've, they've already always had, or even start new things and to join new communities. When I see somebody in, in clinic, it's always with a, with a care partner, often a family member or a close friend. So as well as looking out for your friends and relatives who have dementia themselves, the people supporting them need their own support and need help maintaining their own social contact. stay connected to them, to be there, to be part of their lives and to keep being involved. So living with dementia for me, in my experience, is a bit of a mixed bag. I wanted to continue to work and try to do that, but that didn't work, so I lost my job. I lost my driver's licence. 
I lost a lot of friends and colleagues, but it is a mixed bag because I've also gained and made so many different improvements in my life because I've made new friends, I've made new connections, I've learned a whole load of new skills that I never thought I would be able to learn. My immediate family have been amazing around the house and in the garden and so on. The physical adaptations, there's a ramp in the garden now instead of the stairs. My friends are also marvellous. So if we're going out, they'll message or call that day, remind me of the time, remind me of the place, remind me if I need to take a gift or if I have to take money to pay for something. If I'm not really wanting to go out, because socially it can be tricky to go out sometimes, they keep it flexible and they keep it, you know, just so that it's within my comfort zone. I am a founder member of a peer support group here in Fife called STAND. We have cognitive activities like songwriting, arts and craft, lots and lots of different things that you can do and just be socially connected with people who are like you, but different. So one of my favourite things to do is to be walking. I have a wee dog and we're out walking all the time. Now I find that really helps me to get out the house, but it's also a marvellous connection with the community because when you're out walking, people stop and they chat to you. So I find that keeps me really connected with the world around me. The more social interaction you have and the more positive it is, the more rich and fulfilled your life is. Well, my wife had noticed, I mean, she has expertise in dementia from her professional life, and she had noticed some years ago that I was having problems uh, cognitively and memory-wise, and as a result of her encouragement, uh, I self-referred. They did a scan of my brain and discovered that large parts of it were no longer there. <laughs> um, which is the cause of my dementia. But the main support's from Joan, my wife, um, who is always very keen to keep me organised uh, and busy. I mean, I'm retired now, so there's obviously, uh, life is much easier than it used to be in many respects. Um, but I go out to the pub and meet friends regularly once a week. I, you know, do a lot of walking, I do a lot of reading. We're very busy with the grandchildren, so yeah, um, all these things are good. I actually made friends with somebody. We've become very close, and um, we now play we play canasta with them as a couple every week, every Sunday evening. It's just a routine, and it's really annoying because Danny nearly always wins. He's so good at it. Um, but it's it's a great leveller, and if people can find a game that they can all play, I think it's a really good thing. It's the same person, uh, and although they may have problems with organisation or short-term memory, they still have the same relationship with you. When I first heard it was dementia, I was floored. I stopped talking this much. Stop doing the things I used to. I was acting differently. None of these people have dementia. They are the friends and family of people who do. Steve just being himself again made all the difference to me. Even if he does act the clown. When a friend or relative is first diagnosed with dementia, it's natural not to know what to do, but helping someone stay connected and socially active can help them stay well for longer. It's time to rethink dementia. Following a diagnosis of dementia, it's really important that people engage socially to maintain a quality of life, to maintain a support structure around them during a, a challenging time in, in their life. My name's Tom Russ, I am an old age psychiatrist, which means I'm a doctor that, that looks after people who have dementia. Um, and I have the privilege of spending half my time working clinically in the NHS, but I also spend half my time on research. 
there are a couple of ways that um, social contact is important in relation to somebody who, who, who might be developing dementia. The first is that, that very often we see people disengaging from social contacts that they, that they used to um, engage in, and that clearly has a, a detrimental effect on their life and their, and their quality of life. But we also know from research that having fewer social contacts can increase the risk of subsequently developing dementia. So actually maintaining these, these social contacts is, is protective, is really helpful for somebody's health. One way that you could help them is, is not to be embarrassed about, about keeping in touch with them and, and asking about how they're doing, encouraging them to, to keep active, encouraging them to keep socially engaged and to, to keep up the links that they've, they've already always had, or even start new things and to join new communities. When I see somebody in, in clinic, it's always with a, with a care partner, often a family member or a close friend. So as well as looking out for your friends and relatives who have dementia themselves, the people supporting them need their own support and need help maintaining their own social contact. Stay connected to them, to be there, to be part of their lives and to keep being involved. So living with dementia for me, in my experience, is a bit of a mixed bag. I wanted to continue to work and try to do that, but that didn't work so I lost my job. I lost my driver's licence, I lost a lot of friends and colleagues, but it is a mixed bag because I've also gained and made so many different improvements in my life because I've made new friends, I've made new connections, I've learned a whole load of new skills that I never thought I would be able to learn. My immediate family have been amazing around the house and in the garden and so on. The physical adaptions, there's a ramp in the garden now instead of the stairs. My friends are also marvellous. So if we're going out, they'll message or call that day, remind me of the time, remind me of the place, remind me if I need to take a gift or if I have to take money to pay for something. If I'm not really wanting to go out, because socially it can be tricky to go out sometimes, they keep it flexible and they keep it, you know, just so that it's within my comfort zone. I am a founder member of a peer support group here in Fife called STAND. We have cognitive activities like songwriting, arts and craft, lots and lots of different things that you can do and just be socially connected with people who are like you but different. So one of my favourite things to do is to be walking. I have a wee dog and we're out walking all the time. Now I find that really helps me to get out the house but it's also a marvellous connection with the community because when you're out walking people stop and they chat to you. So I find that keeps me really connected with the world around me. The more social interaction you have and the more positive it is, the more rich and fulfilled your life is. Well, my wife had noticed, I mean, she has expertise in dementia from her professional life, and she had noticed some years ago that I was having problems uh, cognitively and memory-wise. And as a result of her encouragement, uh, I self-referred. They did a scan of my brain and discovered that large parts of it were no longer there. <laughs> um, which is the cause of my dementia. But the main support's from Joan, my wife, um, who is always very keen to keep me organised uh, and busy. I mean, I'm retired now, so there's obviously, uh, life is much easier than it used to be in many respects. Um, but I go out to the pub and meet friends regularly once a week. I, you know, do a lot of walking, I do a lot of reading. We're very busy with the grandchildren, so yeah, um, all these things are good. I actually made friends with somebody, we've become very close, and um, we now play, we play canasta with them as a couple every week, every Sunday evening. It's just a routine, 
and it's really annoying because Danny nearly always wins. He's so good to tip. Um, but it's it's a great leveller and if people can find a game that they can all play, I think it's a really good thing. It's the same person uh, and although they may have problems with organisation or short-term memory, they still have the same relationship with you. When I first heard it was dementia, I was floored. I stopped talking this much. Stop doing the things I used to. I was acting differently. None of these people have dementia. They are the friends and family of people who do. Steve just being himself again made all the difference to me, even if he does act the clown. When a friend or relative is first diagnosed with dementia, it's natural not to know what to do, but helping someone stay connected and socially active can help them stay well for longer. It's time to rethink dementia. Following a diagnosis of dementia, it's really important that people engage socially to maintain a quality of life, to maintain a support structure around them during a, a, a challenging time in, in their life. My name's Tom Russ. I am an old age psychiatrist, which means I'm a doctor that, that looks after people who have dementia. Um, and I have the privilege of spending half my time working clinically in the NHS, but I also spend half my time on research. There are a couple of ways that um, social contact is important in relation to somebody who, who, who might be developing dementia. The first is that, that very often we see people disengaging from social contacts that they, that they used to um, engage in, and that clearly has a, a detrimental effect on their life and their, and their quality of life. But we also know from research that having fewer social contacts can increase the risk of subsequently developing dementia. So actually maintaining these, these social contacts is, is protective, is really helpful for somebody's health. One way that you could help them is, is not to be embarrassed about, about keeping in touch with them and, and asking about how they're doing, encouraging them to, to keep active, encouraging them to keep socially engaged and to, to keep up the links that they've, they've already always had or even start new things and to join new communities. When I see somebody in, in clinic, it's always with a, with a care partner, often a family member or a close friend. So as well as looking out for your friends and relatives who have dementia themselves, the people supporting them need their own support and need help maintaining their own social contact. stay connected to them, to be there, to be part of their lives and to keep being involved. So living with dementia for me, in my experience, is a bit of a mixed bag. I wanted to continue to work and try to do that, but that didn't work, so I lost my job. I lost my driver's licence. I lost a lot of friends and colleagues, but it is a mixed bag because I've also gained and made so many different improvements in my life because I've made new friends, I've made new connections, I've learned a whole load of new skills that I never thought I would be able to learn. My immediate family have been amazing around the house and in the garden and so on. The physical adaptions, there's a ramp in the garden now instead of the stairs. My friends are also marvellous. So if we're going out, they'll message or call that day, remind me of the time, remind me of the place, remind me if I need to take a gift or if I have to take money to pay for something. If I'm not really wanting to go out, because socially it can be tricky to go out sometimes, they keep it flexible and they keep it, you know, just so that it's within my comfort zone. I am a founder member of a peer support group here in Fife called STAND. We have cognitive activities like songwriting, arts and craft, lots and lots of different things that you can do and just be socially connected with people who are like you but different. So one of my favourite things to do is to be walking. I have a wee dog and we're out walking all the time. Now I find that really helps me to get out the house but it's also a marvellous connection with the community. 
because when you're out walking, people stop and they chat to you. So I find that keeps me really connected with the world around me. The more social interaction you have and the more positive it is, the more rich and fulfilled your life is. Well, my wife had noticed, I mean, she has expertise in dementia from her professional life, and she had noticed some years ago that I was having problems uh, cognitively and memory-wise, and as a result of her encouragement, uh, I self-referred. They did a scan of my brain and discovered that large parts of it were no longer there. <laughs> um, which is the cause of my dementia. But the main support's from Joan, my wife, um, who is always very keen to keep me organised <laughs> and busy. I mean, I'm retired now, so there's obviously, uh, life is much easier than it used to be in many respects. Um, but I go out to the pub and meet friends regularly once a week. I, you know, do a lot of walking, I do a lot of reading. We're very busy with the grandchildren, so yeah, um, all these things are good. I actually made friends with somebody. We've become very close, and um, we now play we play canasta with them as a couple every week, every Sunday evening. It's just a routine, and it's really annoying because Danny nearly always wins. He's so good at it. Um, but it's it's a great leveller, and if people can find a game that they can all play, I think it's a really good thing. It's the same person, uh, and although they may have problems with organisation or short-term memory, they still have the same relationship with you. I first heard it was dementia. I was floored. I stopped talking this much. Stop doing the things I used to. I was acting differently. None of these people have dementia. They are the friends and family of people who do. Steve just being himself again made all the difference. Great, I think just about everybody's managed to make it back into the room, which is pretty good for a Monday lunch break. We are probably only running a couple of minutes behind time. So welcome back to everybody here in the Science Centre this afternoon and particularly welcome back to everybody who is at home and online. Hope you had a good lunch too. We did here. So, yes, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for the afternoon, David Duke. David Duke's CEO and founder of Street Soccer Scotland, who's going to be sharing his story with us. And to help him along, he's going to have his colleague, Jerry Britton, who's going to give David the cues and give him an interview to find out more about his personal experience, which powered the idea behind the organisation. Uh, and I think probably the clues in the name, and I suspect everybody in the room's probably heard of Street Soccer, but um, Street Soccer uses football-inspired training and personal development as a medium for empowering people who are affected by social exclusion. So really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, David and Jerry, over to you. <laughs> David and Jerry, it sounds like a cartoon, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, okay, so David, founder, CEO of Street Soccer Scotland, an organisation that's assisted over 25,000 players. Uh, we recently celebrated our 15th anniversary. Um, when we arrived here today, I know our head offices are in Leith, but this area has uh, residents with yourself having been brought up and governing, and that's probably 
a good starting point in terms of if you could give your um, backstory um, so far up to the, the emergence of street soccer Scotland. Yeah, so it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, so street soccer started about 15 years ago, but the, the story behind it started probably when I was a child growing up in, in, in Govan, just across the water there. I can actually see my old house and the, the White Houses. Um, so basically, you know, and we're here talking about the National Care Service and, you know, as a kid, you know, I, I relied on quite a lot of care myself, you know, I grew up, my, my dad was a, an alcoholic, so he was struggling with, with an illness, uh, my mum struggled with mental health and stuff like that, so as, as, as a kid, I kind of grew up with quite, quite a lot of chaos and stuff around me. Um, through my, my dad's drinking, my parents split up when I was 13 and I was kind of, I became almost like a carer for my dad, so, you know, kind of dropped out of school at 13 um, and just tried to kind of, you know, get through things, you know, and today you're, you're going to hear a lot about, you know, a lot about kind of care and the need for care and stuff like that, but when I reflect back, and you know, I'm going back to 1993, you know, I, I was fortunate that I lived in a community which cared. Uh, I lived in a community which understood that, you know, some people weren't doing so well in the community and I was looked out for, you know, so I was probably the best fed boy in Govan, to be honest, because uh, everyone knew my situation. So I was very lucky that kind of, you know, Mrs. Stewart and Mrs. McCann would always make sure that I was okay during these difficult times. But, you know, as, as I kind of started to get older, 16, 17, my dad was getting worse. He, he got evicted from the, the, the house. So he moved in with his brother. I, I had to go and kind of stay with my sister and, and stay with Kind of my girlfriend in anywhere I kind of could could find at that point, um, and and then he passed away. You know, alcohol. Um, you know, he, he he couldn't get through his illness, so I, I lost him, and I just went into kind of I just shut down mentally. Um, kind of cut myself off with family and friends, and and moved to another side of Glasgow, and I, it was just kind of eating away at me. I was trying to crack on, and you know, I was working and stuff like that, and. But I was drinking too much or I wasn't turning up because I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't in a good place mentally. Um, and then I became homeless myself for, for three years. I entered the system. In fact, it was the old Govan Dry Docks over there is when I first bumped into a, a youth worker who actually went, was in my school a couple of years older than me who, who pointed me in the direction of the Hamish Allen Centre. Um, and as you, you know, I was a young guy trying to, you know, didn't, you don't get trained what to do when you become homeless. You don't get trained what to do when you're in crisis. So I was just kind of navigating, you know, I was staying in all the big, some of you might remember all the big kind of council run hostels and stuff like that. Cheapside Street, Bell Street, or Nightmare in Bell Street as we, we called it. Um, Broad Street, you know, all these places which were really, really dangerous, you know, because a lot of people in, in the hostel who all needed levels of support themselves, you know, and you're all kind of just stuck there trying to, trying to survive. Um, Duke Street, that's it. And yeah, I just didn't, down the road for there. Um, so, you know, as a young person, I was fortunate to get involved with a charity called Quarriers, who do quite a lot of different care services. And at the time, they had a young person support, young person supported accommodation just over on Port Shores Road. And through that, that was my first element of support and my first element of care in terms of being receiving it. I had a support worker, Alice, who, who who spoke to me and tried to unpick all the stuff that was in my head and allowed me to kind of talk about how I was feeling and all that and trying to kind of work it out. But the, So that was great. The other other forms of care that even if there was a befriending service, because people always think, you know, you know, talk about ending homelessness and tackling homelessness. All the research that I've ever done within street soccer, we, we always ask the question, what, what does better look like? And and, it, and no one ever mentions an actual house. It's relationships, it's purpose, it's feeling that they're part of something or feeling that they can trust people. And I think things like in the James Shields project at the time, they had like befriending services, they had activity stuff. That was all the stuff that allowed me to escape what was going on. The house would come, but at the time, that's what I needed. And and the big change came for me when, you know, I seen a poster advertising a football tournament, which the big issue was running. And it was... It's part of the, the Homeless World Cup. It's one of the first Homeless World Cups back in 2004. Uh, and that was it for me. Football was something that I always engaged in as a kid. It was always an escapism, even back in 93. You know, I'd take my boy out and try and forget all the madness that was going on in the house. 
football found me again, and I was lucky enough to go and play for Scotland at the Homeless World Cup, and and that was a ch that was a change for me, you know, because it wasn't actually, you know, pulling on the Scotland strip and all that was great, but it was actually the three months before that, because I went from sitting in a hostel having nowhere to be, only a support worker, to actually having a peer group, going out in the pitch and, you know, having something to look forward to, having somewhere where I could connect with other people, having role models within my coaches, these were all the things that I needed. And that's and that's what it gave me. And you know, five years later, I was lucky enough to you know go back into education and train as a community worker. I worked for Big Issue Foundation. I worked for the council and doing youth work. But I always knew that that initial you know period of time when I found that wee bit of purpose and having somewhere to go and somewhere to be really changed my life. And, and that was why street soccer started back in two thousand nine. And it was you know we could, I couldn't scale. We, we can't send everybody to go and play for Scotland at the Homeless World Cup. But what you could do is provide more opportunities for people to come together, for people to belong to something, to feel part of something, and to access support service that they maybe never knew existed, or maybe didn't know how to access, because it's fine having loads of services in Scotland, but if you don't know how to get to them, or you're not even, you don't even get the confidence or the, you know, the, you know, to actually reach out and ask for help, Street Soccer provides that, you know, so we started in 2009, um, Literally with a bag of Fitboys, you know, and a second-hand laptop and a poster and a cheeky smile. But it's, you know, the need was there. It was just constantly getting more people coming down, more people coming down. And, and that's when we started, you know, obviously it was founded on lived experience, but, you know, we started investing in our players. And so players started to become coaches and then they started to live on their own sessions and it just kind of went through there. Yeah, and so you're talking about players and, and a pathway within the organisation and you're the prime example of that obviously but what types of impact can street soccer make on the lives of the players that come to our, our programmes at, at this current stage? I mean I think it's 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 based on you know each individual you know because everybody's journey is different everybody's needs different and for us the good thing about street soccer is, you know, it's not just street soccer. You know, there's so many organisations who plug in to street soccer, you know. So if, it's, if we're working with people kind of in recovery and so on, so, you know, we work with Phoenix House and Jericho Houses and, and, and then they'll refer people who are coming through their programme to give people, you know, something to find a bit of structure as they progress through their, through their journey or, you know, Sam H. And, you know, there's been loads of organisations who all kind of work together to, to, to provide that. But I think... The first thing that people can expect is just to feel that they're, that they're somewhere that they feel loved and feel wanted and, you know, there's it's a kind of non-paid-for relationship. So, so relationships are being formed on the pitch, but it's all built on trust, you know, and it's all built on, you know, a lot, most 80% of our, front, our coaches, not I say frontline staff, but we call them coaches, you know, 80% of our guys have all come through the programme, so they've all got lived experience, so it's easier to build those relationships on the pitch, you know, and build that trust because I think unless there's trust then you can't kinda move forward, you know, because it's there's a lot of people who have been kinda dealt a promise so many times in life, you know, we're talking about the National Care Service and we're talking about our table and it's like if you're gonna make this work, you need to have trust. You know, the sector needs to buy into it. The sector needs to trust it because we hear quite a lot of things quite a lot of times, you know, and the only way it's going to work is if we, we buy into it and we trust, and that only comes from good leadership and communication. Do you know what I mean? So, and we'll hear a bit more about that later on. But for me, street soccer is whatever it, people want it to be. You know, wh whatever they need, whether it's access to, you know, housing support or a mental health. What, what we will try and facilitate that. If we can't do it with the team that we've got, then we'll certainly point people in the right direction. But for me, it's always about having that reason to wake up in the morning, that kind of purpose, and somewhere to be and somewhere to go to. And you, you touched on it there in terms of the creation of the National Care Service and the ongoing re-evaluation of the, the status quo. So from your own lived experience and also your experience through street soccer, what, what advice or observations would you give to the, to the room here today on the potential to effect change and, and make a, a positive impact going forward? I'm probably not the best person to actually give advice based on the amount of people in this room who, who know far more about it than me, but 
the change is always difficult, you know, and I think, you know, outside of this room, there's a, you know, things aren't great out there, particularly if you're working in the front line, you know, the front line's never been tested so much in its life, you know, and we've seen, you know, we all, I always feel, this is in my view, I always feel the third, third sector's always forgot about, you know, and, and we see a lot of the budget challenges we get, is that a lot of that's came from public sector pay reviews and everything else, but the third sector's always just there, you know, with, with its heart and its hand, to kind of try to keep people going, and I think we need to, we need to protect the third sector. You know, we need to protect every, anybody working in the care sector, but we just need to remember that, you know, the hardest job is when you're working with people, you know, and having to take, you know, you're listening to people's challenges and you're trying to provide a solution and, you know, and we need to make sure that we're protecting, you know, the people that are there to serve our community, you know. Um, but I think it's, and I spoke to me and Marie had a good chat at the table, and I think it's about, you know, when you're trying to affect changes, how do you get people to buy into it? And that comes with strong, honest communication, you know, why we're doing it, you know, um, and then finding that leadership and getting everybody to kind of buy into it. Because as I say, you know, obviously I go to a lot of things in homelessness sectors and, and you know, and we've been here, but we just need to, I think everybody needs to be part of it so we all know where we're going, what's our North Star, you know, and, and, and how we can all play a part around, just come here to listen. How can we all come here to make sure everybody's got a voice in it and everybody's part of it, or it's just another conference, do you know what I mean? Um, so I, sorry, I, I, I ramble, I don't have any notes, so I just kind of talk to somebody who tells me to stop. <laughs> and, and I'm getting that signal from Carson there, but I'm sure everyone would, would join me in thanking David for his time and his extremely insightful observations. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very inspiring. Should we? Yeah. Thanks very much, David. Um, that I, I'm sure everybody's found that really inspiring. And uh, inspiring is an overused word. If you're in the third sector, like I am, it's a word we use probably about ten times every day. But there is something really par powerful about what happens when people get together, isn't there, and, and work for that change. And I think the other conversations we were having at the table with the minister was around tenacity, resilience, keeping going for it, and the guts that that takes. And I think the work you've done in street soccer absolutely exemplifies that. And you talked about trust, and you used a phrase I've not heard for um, before in that, in that, that non-paid-for relationship. I think that just goes to the heart of it, too. You bringing on your coaches to, to inspire others to keep going. So thank you. I think that was really sets the tone for the afternoon. Thank you, David. So it's my pleasure now to open up our panel discussion for the afternoon. I think as we've been talking this morning and even over lunchtime, you can hear the energy and commitment and the sense of there's a wee sense of frustration. We know that things are not moving forward the way we all would have wanted as we desperately seek that, that reform for, for people across Scotland in social care. But I can also hear the determination to keep going and to be part of the conversation moving forward. So I really hope our panel this afternoon helps to further those conversations too. And it is my great pleasure now to welcome those people onto the room and up onto the stage. And whilst we do, I know we're going to have a word cloud coming up that's going to be um, showing some of the words and phrases that come up over the morning. So it's my pleasure to welcome onto the stage, um, I do feel like something now from a Eurovision Song Contest, but anyway, Marie Todd, MSB, no singing required unless you really want to, a Minister for Social Care, Mental Wellbeing and Sport, Marie, and then Marion McArdle, Marion, I've lost you in the room now, but from the Social Covenant Steering Group, Marion, please come up. Um, Professor Stephen Gibb from the University of West of Scotland and Graham Galloway from, go, come, come on up everybody, or come on down if you're old enough to remember that, from Meeting Centre Scotland and James Calder from the Minority Ethnic Carers of People Project, MICOP, as I think many of us will know. Marion, come and have a seat. Um, and then as everybody comes up, what we shall do is invite you all to briefly introduce yourselves and just say a wee bit about your role or interest in social reform. So, James, you and I have not had the pleasure of meeting, so why don't you start? So, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, can people hear me? Should do, have you been mic'd up? I have not. Um, right, okay. <laughs> start someone else and you can borrow the mic. Graham, why don't you kick us off? Oh, I think it's not mic now. <laughs> 
Great. You start. Oh, well, on you go, James. See how you go. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Calder. I'm the National Policy and Engagement Officer for MECO. Uh -oh. So we support uh, unpaid carers from uh, Scotland's minority ethnic communities. Um, so very pleased to be here this afternoon. Great. Thanks. Graham. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Graham Galloway. I'm the Chief Officer of Meet Me Centre Scotland. Um, we are a dementia support charity. We support a, a network of over 20 community hubs um, that support people living with dementia. Great, thanks, Graham. And Marion, you don't have a mic. Can pass the mic along? Be super. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, Marion McArdle. I, I've been invited here today as a person um, who has a lived experience of uh, using social care services. Uh, I have a daughter who is 41 now. Um, she has profound complex needs. Oh, hold oh, hold it closer to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be working so now. Scary. Just go, okay. the, don't worry, you speak and the, the gentleman will sort it out for you. Go for it, Marion. Okay, I'm here because my, my daughter uh, has profound complex needs and she's 41 years old now. And I just think after 41 years, we kind of get an idea of what works and what doesn't work, so hopefully that will be helpful. Great, thanks, Marion. Hi, I'm Stephen Gibb from the University of the West of Scotland, and I've spent about 30-odd years researching and teaching on culture and leadership, and uh, have been doing quite a bit of that, specifically on the area of health and social care integration recently. Uh, hi, my name's Marie Todd, and I'm Minister for Social Care, Mental Wellbeing and Sport. And as Graham knows, I do like a song. We <laughs> Kayleigh often in the dementia community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> good. Well, that's a good place to start. So if you want to answer the first question in song, Marie, we'll go for it. But I think for everybody in the room, and maybe on level states and spoken word, but let's see how we go. So really, I think one of the questions coming through for all of us is, is and we heard the Cabinet Secretary talking to this this morning, rights and equalities are obviously going to be at the heart of the National Care Service. There's going to be a charter of rights and responsibilities. And I hope people have had a chance to maybe pick up a copy and have a look at that today. Um, principles will be law. There's going to be a new complaint service services and improved access to independent advocacy. What else are we going to need to do, uh, Minister, to embed rights and equalities into the National Care Service? So I think, um, I was thinking carefully about this on my way over today, and I think that, that one of the things that happens when you start with a human rights approach is that you build services differently. They look and feel a bit different. Um, instead of trying to squeeze people into what's available so we've got this service this service this service this service which one can i offer to you you start with the person and you say well this person has a right for example to education that's a very common one children have a right a human right to education and when that's easy it's pretty straightforward. So for most children, they can access that right quite easily. But for some children, it's really hard to access that right. And they find it hard to be at school. They find it hard to be involved in the things that are being offered around the school community. So we need to develop something that's a little bit different for them. And I suppose for me, what we need to embed that rights based approach, and we've heard a bit about it today, is we need to offer people choice and to make sure the system is flexible enough to accommodate that. There needs to be accountability, so what happens when your rights aren't upheld? You know, so that is really important. So when children's right to education isn't upheld, or when an adult's right to access healthcare isn't upheld, as I here regularly, so who should be held accountable for that? And in the system of social care that we have in Scotland, that isn't particularly clear. It's very difficult. Firstly, for individuals who are navigating it, so it's really hard for people to know, what are my rights? What do I have a right to? And if I'm not getting that need and right met, who do I speak to about it to make sure that that is met? So I would say there's quite a lot we need to do to change the way things are, but the prize is huge. And I suppose 
we meet here today at a time where we've made huge progress actually with the National Care Service, but everyone in this room is aware that there are challenges right at this moment in time and how we find our way forward. But we're all absolutely agreed. I haven't heard a single person here today argue that things need to stay the same as they are right now. So every single person here has agreed that we need to change things and do things differently as we move forward. And I have to say that's really, really powerful for me to hear and emboldening. Watch bold, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> thank so, you, Min. Yeah. No, thank and I, you. I think we've heard very powerfully about what happens when people's rights aren't upheld. That's the system we have at the moment. And we need that to change. I think I think that's that's really valid, and I guess I as as you talk to that and everybody's human rights, I immediately think about people for whom I've advocated in the past who can't have make their own voices heard particularly easily. And I wonder, James, if I might turn to you and get your thoughts on that. Would be great. Yeah, I think it's um, it's working. Now. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I mean, I, I'm listening to you, Mr. Mary. There, the um, you're talking about choice and accountability, um, and I think that's extremely important here. Uh, thinking about the people that we support, which are unpaid carers from minority ethnic communities, and all too often that choice doesn't exist at the moment. Um, it's you know, rather kind of inconsistent approach that we see across Scotland. Um, at times we give lip service towards kind of equalities issues without necessarily Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Go again, just go again. Okay. Well, um, so just kind of going back to that. Um, obviously, really pleased to hear Mary talking about um, sort of choice and accountability here, because um, all too often with the the people that we're supporting, um, so we're thinking about unpaid carers, those in minority ethnic communities in particular. Um, right now, there isn't much in the way of choice or accountability. Um, we see a really inconsistent approach across Scotland. Um, that, you know, it's, there's a there's sort of lip service a lot of the time towards equalities issues, without anything really backing it up. Um, currently, we've got um, about 30 local carer strategies that we've um, sort of looked through. Only about 15 of them actually have kind of outcomes that are designed to um, tackle equalities issues for BME communities, for instance. Um, so we do need to see a sort of more joined-up approach here. Um, making sure that um, you know these equalities issues are addressed um, and that there's things like EQIAs that are an integral part of this are actually used properly and not just uh, used as a tick box exercise and the other thing just thinking about for carers as well is um, you know one of the really important things that carers want to see is a is, is that right to a short break for caring which I know is an important part of the, the government's work here um, right now, you know, there's, there's issues, of, you know, regarding sort of choice and diversity there too. Um, and if we're really wanting to make sure that the, you know, the human rights of, of carers are kind of taken care of here as well, we need to make sure that, that, that there is that work towards that right to break from caring. Thank you, James. And I think, Graham, as well, if we've talked about the change we want to see and how will we know if it's working? How will we make sure we test and embed that into our working practices? Well, I think it's getting back to the, the accountability that Marie was talking about. So I think we need to, we need to ensure that there's, there's really robust mechanisms in place for people to be able to complain when things aren't working because that just simply doesn't exist just now. And that's very much also linked in with the really strong advocacy that needs to be there as well. So how will we know things are working? Complaints will get upheld. Will be taken seriously. Yeah. That's how we know that it's working. Yeah, that's very clear and simple. And I don't know if there's anything, the Minister, you'd like to come back on from James and Graham's comments. No, I mean, I think you're right. I'd, I'd like to think, uh, whilst I imagine in that utopian future that there will be a lot of complaints initially, I'd like to think that people will feel the difference. So the number of times that you have to complain. You know, I spoke to a room full of advocates recently and I say I'm really passionate about advocacy. There are many people I meet who are unable to have their voices heard and who need to have a voice that is heard in their place. But actually, I would like to see a social care system that works first time so you don't have to, nobody has to fight to 
get the care that they want. And I guess we'll feel that difference when we get there as yeah. well. We'll feel that we have a social care system that mostly works well for most people who need to access it. And we'll have a strong system of support and advocacy for those who aren't getting their rights upheld and a system of accountability. Yeah, no, thank you. And I guess, um, well, I mean, I think from my work and time in the charity sector and a bit wider, sometimes the, the strongest and most passionate champions for advocating for the rights and the care that people need are, are the professionals working directly in those care services, which I think probably brings me quite neatly into the next question, which is really thinking about culture leadership and the leadership that we're going to need to really deliver a successful national care strategy. And Professor Gibb, I know that University of Western Scotland's really done a lot of work in it, that you've been a leader and it'd be really great to, to, to hear from you about, um, and I'm sorry to say, the little evidence you found of that good practice or success from workforce, workforce culture leadership and integration. It'd be great to hear a wee bit about that, please. Absolutely. So it's rather frightening for me to be here in this way because people always think, well, the academics, they've got the answers and they'll go on at length about them. I won't because I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key thing that we found is that nobody really knows. And this is not a Scottish problem. The problems of integrated care and delivering systems that are fit for purpose with the demands that are there, the UK wide, it's Europe wide, it, it's global. Yeah. And we, what we see at least in Scotland and what's, what I find really <coughs> heartening is at least trying to do something to get beyond that let's have another report about it let's have another commission let's uh, you know do all that kind of gathering of the, the the worthies together to actually try and do something implement something and make a difference and we're therefore experiencing what that's like and what what's that like in terms of culture and leadership it's messy it's complicated and it's really ultra challenging and, and part of that, I think, goes down to we don't even really know about the different cultures. Is it the same in the NHS as it is in the local authority, as it is in a third sector care delivery or a private sector care delivery organisation, an SMA in a large uh, global chain? No, it's not. But what are the differences in those cultures? How are they working? And when you try and put them together and make them collaborate, maybe some of the things that happen are that they're not really very aware of their own cultures <laughs> and their own ways of uh, working. And if you can't do it yourself, then how can you do it collaboratively and together? So we really need to learn a lot more and we need to learn it together and we need to learn it very quickly. And uh, that's one of the things I think that, that there seems to be a commitment to. There's an awful lot of people in the Scottish Government working behind the scenes on various projects that are going to be shared and delivered in terms of their outcomes. But that's not a one-off event. And this annual event is, is, is part of that. We're going to need to learn very quickly and improve on culture and leadership over the next year, over the next three years, and the next yeah. five years to deliver not just the resource, but the kind of hearts and minds beyond uh, what's needed to deliver a proper national care service that gives yeah. everybody what they want. Yeah, thanks, Professor Kevin. I'm just wondering, James, from your perspective, have you got any experience of where that kind of you can see the impact of the struggles to collaborate well through the process we have at the minute? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Sadly, we, we find that many, I mean, many of the, the, the carers that we support from BME communities. Um, is that better? Right, I... Oh, yeah, that's it now, I think. Is that better? Can you hear? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm definitely not a singer. <laughs> Nor do you want me to start today. I'll, I'll try better, thank you. Um, so... I think sadly right now um, we find that a number of the, um, the carers that we support from BME communities find themselves uh, you know, missing out because of uh, a lack of collaboration. And some of this I think is related to things that are internal to kind of local authority areas. Some of it is more national in scale. Um, so at the moment, you know, some of the challenges that we see are communications issues, uh, lack of appropriate service provision, um, and this, you know, this has a, a significantly detrimental impact here. So you know, within local authorities, I think there needs to be a sort of greater emphasis on kind of collaboration, not just within services and local authorities, but also with community organizations, third sector providers, um, and you know, to, to take on some of that work. Nationally, though, I think there needs to be a greater emphasis on sharing best practice because there are actually some good examples out there um, with, 
which if you go out and look for, for those examples, you can, you can actually be inspired by, by it. But right now, I don't think there's been a huge amount, of, there's, there's not really been that kind of forum for many to actually share that as well. So from my perspective, if we can, you know, if we can take sort of an opportunity there to um, at least allow um, different areas of the country to share their good stories and also share their challenges, then hopefully that could better serve the communities we, we support. And there's something really inspirational about actually hearing some of those examples of good practice. I don't know, James, if you've got any specific examples you could share, maybe, well, Professor, if you could build on that wee bit. Well, I mean, just a really positive one that I've been sort of in discussions with over the last few months is uh, Falkirk Health and Social Care Partnership, who work with an organization locally called Almazar, um, who the, you know, they're an organization that are sort of primarily supporting uh, women in, uh, in communities in, in the area. But um, through their partnership with this organization, I think they've identified about 70 unpaid carers that were not necessarily identified before and are able to better provide supports. So it's just a really nice example of some good work there. That's, I mean, it's great to hear. And Professor Gibb, I don't know if there's anything you want to build up. You must have seen some good examples too. M many, many, many great examples of wonderful people doing amazing things, absolutely. But they're, they're working in a labyrinth that makes collaboration <laughs> really difficult and yeah. challenging. But, but more than that, what I see is there's a glass ceiling in the system where learning from that reaches a certain point and then it doesn't go any yeah. broader, it doesn't go any further. Um, will the National Care Service help change that? I, I, I hope it does, absolutely. And what, and what do you think it needs to do to make that change? Is it back to, back to that leadership point or is something more nuts and boltsy? Uh, yeah, it's back to the leadership thing. So again, in terms of leadership, I would divide it into core leadership. And distributed leadership is what I would describe it as. And the core leadership is the strategic control people with the visions, mm -hmm. the uh, Scottish government ministers <laughs> and Gosla and others in the NHS and uh, elsewhere that are responsible for putting together these, these visions and making them happen. And we can see at the moment that there's you know, clear, clear issues around that. Uh, the distributed leadership is the people in the middle and at the front line who are making things um, happen. Mm -hmm. Why aren't these people developed and trained together? Why aren't they uh, working together in, in other ways in the system? Uh, because they're, they're just not at the moment. Mm -hmm. Even leadership development is like a, an NHS-led thing and there's not that much engagement of people in the uh, social care world or social work world with, with that. So if you want a culture that's got a coherent set of people working together with shared values and good relationships and trust, then the first thing you tend to do is to get them to all train and develop together, and that doesn't happen yet. So maybe if the National Care Service can help put in place something yeah. along those lines, that would be a, a step in the right direction. Yeah, and I, I would agree, and I think from my experience, time and again, you hear these community-developed initiatives that really, really flourish locally, sometimes in coming back to David's point, it's really challenging financial circumstances. And, and Graham, now in your role as Chief Executive Meeting Centre of Scotland, here's another initiative that's ground-led, but taking on Scotland-wide leadership. Is that yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, if you look at kind of a collaborative model, that's what the South South sector operates. We have to, you know, resources are limited. So meeting centres, I think, are a, a great example uh, of that kind of bottom-up approach when communities have, have properly invested and bought in because they're the ones that are doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I think at a kind of national level, we've actually had a really great example of collaboration on the boards here today where the, uh, the, the Rethink Dementia campaign adverts have been showing. So this is the really first public facing part of the, the, the new Scottish dementia strategy, um, which was very much co-produced by people with dementia and their care partners. Um, I remember when I went along to the first meeting uh, to develop the new strategy, my first question was, where are the people with dementia in this room? There was nobody with dementia there. Four years on, we now have a lived experience yeah. group that isn't a separate group, it's part of the main strategy group. Each of the subgroups is co-chaired by either a person with dementia or an unpaid family member. Um, so I think that that's a really clear evidence of how we can yeah. do this proper co-production uh, at the at national level. Yeah, and I think for me, and I'm, I'm going to display my own 20 years in the charity sector experience, there's something really, really powerful about working together in communities, because for me, that 
draws us right back to something that's at the core, I know, of where we want to go with national care services around person-centred care, isn't it? And I think draw the conversation forward into that. We absolutely know it's so important to give individuals as much control and choice as possible over future care and support that they might need. And we're looking how to do that within the National Care Service, of course, and a get it right for everyone approach. And I think now it'd be really great um, to hear from the panel about how will we know if they're doing this well and what will the noticeable difference be? And I think, Marion, if it's okay to come to you first and, and really hear your thoughts and opinions on that, be brilliant. Thank you. Um, is that on? Is that on? Yes. I think it's working. Yeah, yeah Marion. Yeah. Go for it. So to give, talking about choice and control and getting it right for everyone, the everyone must mean every individual, every each and every person, you know, when they start thinking all about it, and there's a lot of things out there, people will, you can't just get it right for some, it needs to be for everyone. And to make it about each individual, um, we have to look at this place of person-centred, that person-led approach, person-centred way of um, explaining it. And we need, <coughs> we need to get that right. And how, how do we get it right? So if someone is having their, their, their needs assessed or whatever, the person assessing those needs needs to be aware that this is going to be all about that person. It needs to be all about the person. And if it isn't about the person, 100% you're going to get it wrong. You'll get it wrong. And if it is all about the person, you're going to get it right as well. So somehow that seems to be a difficult I've heard the expression person-centred for years and years and lots of people will say, yeah, absolutely, I haven't had any of the idea yet, it's person-centred, and yes, we, yeah, we don't see it happening. So often we don't see it happening. Um, and I know there's organisations who profess to be person-centred or person-led and profess to uh, that each person has choice and control in their lives and they actually believe it, and yet it's not happening. So I think we need to look at that and examine it and, and realise why is it not working so that we can learn from that and then we can get it right. And I, maybe this is a good example of night, and it's just a wee of thousands of examples all of us could give, but my daughter, uh, Laura, and I were invited to a birthday party, and this birthday party was of one of her friends um, who also had a learning disability. And a lot of the friends at the party had a learning disability and lovely party, wonderful. And I, I just was watching a group of people on the floor dancing and having a wonderful <laughs> time. And um, I felt, you know, it was lovely to see these faces that were grinning from ear to ear, such joy um, on that dance floor. And then, halfway through the night, I was going into somebody and I looked up and um, these same people that I had been seeing smiling with, and such joy and so happy, now had the opposite expression on their face and people were putting coats on them and helping them to get their coats on because they were taking them home. And I, I couldn't believe it and um, I was just so moved. I actually had tears in my eyes and I asked someone, why, why are these people going home? They're having such a good time. And it was because there was a staff change. It's so probably the, 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 the shift change was the staff. Um, and that organisation um, are particularly known for being um, person-centred. And do you know what I mean? So even if people who really work hard at trying to be person centred and give choice and control, if they're getting it wrong. We are getting it wrong, which we, I've heard loads of stories today where it is going wrong, so I would urge us to really look at why is it going wrong, because I don't think it's rocket science. I think it might be a bit of all these leaders working together, common sense prevailing, because as I say, nobody would argue with this common sense thing that it's about the individual, and yet it isn't happening. And maybe, maybe it doesn't happen in a big organisation because things like budgets get in the way or, or transport issues, staffing issues. And 
but it's don't feel justified in saying I can't make it about you because I've got staffing issues or that. Don't feel that's okay to say that. Um, in, in our circumstance, um, as I said, my Laura, um, Laura, my daughter, uh, has a lot of needs, and that's that's fine. And we get uh, she receives self-directed support, uh, so that that allows her to employ people on a 24/7 basis, and that's lovely because we get to choose people that we think would be really good for Laura, and that's that's great. And do you know it works really well. It really works well, and we see lots of benefits to her life. She absolutely has choice and control in her life every day, even though she has very limited and maybe no verbal communication. Uh, we'd find all these things difficult. But it isn't that difficult, really. If, you, if we care enough to want to get it right for her, then we get it right for her. Um, I was hoping that she would come along today, the, uh, our care of, oh, she has, maybe she has, I see a hand up. Oh, great. <laughs> um, and, but our, our carer that's supporting her today has, uh, you know, made sure that this was only if it suited Laura to come, because this might be a nightmare for her, but obviously that's great. And it's just, ah, oh, she's lovely. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's what I wanted to say, really, to make it, make it a bit of a person. I know it sounds dead obvious to say that, but honestly, I don't think we're giving it enough uh, credence or, or whatever. And I think a wee, a wee benefit, or a big benefit also, we, that we noticed with Laura's life changed uh, almost overnight once she started getting this individualised support or whatever it is you want to call it. We saw health benefits, we saw benefits uh, to her whole being and her happiness. Um, so some people might think that's quite a lot of cost if we have to cost, come up with a budget that's going to support Laura 24-7. But I know we have the evidence that it costs a lot less than it did before. She uses other services. Well, she does now. She hardly ever. And um, health services, she very seldom sees a doctor now. Or a, and I know that there will be people in hospital um, who have fewer health needs than Laura. And she doesn't need to go into hospital. They're all getting met in, in her own home, which is just lovely. So um, I think also we can look at cost effectiveness there as well. Thank you, Mary. And thank, thanks, Laura, Laura, too, for coming along to support your mum today. I think it's really, really important. And person-led approach is, is the way forward. And I guess, I think it maybe touches back a little bit to what the Cabinet Secretary was talking about this morning, really acknowledging that variation from local authority mm -hmm. to local authority. And I know now, Sometimes with the challenges for budgets and everything, I think that I know callers, um, older people calling the Age Scotland helpline are really feeling that squeeze. And I wonder, Minister, if there's any reflections you might want to share from, from Marion and Laura's experiences. Well, I, I think what Marion said there was really powerful. I have to acknowledge that. So I think that one of the things that she said that really struck home for me is if we care enough, we can get it right for everyone. And I just think that's a really powerful way to look at it. So we seem to find this person-led stuff really tough. Um, but if we care enough, we can do it. And if we care enough to say we're not going to, you know, just mm -hmm. drop you, we're going to hang on to you, and we're going to make sure we get it right for you, then I think we can do it. And as Marion says, I'm absolutely certain it's going to cost us long money and in in it's going to cost us less money in the long term. Um, because if we get it right for people, it just prevents so much harm further down the road. So I think we are in, I mean, it's a difficult time to change a system. We were chatting about this earlier. I was saying, does necessity make a difference to how willing people are to change things? I talk regularly about necessity being the mother of invention, and I feel at the moment, you know, the last week or two, there's a real resistance to change, and that's being expressed very, very loudly to me. But I'm more confident than ever that change is what we need, and it's absolutely essential that we change the way we do things. When people talk about the change 
the NHS has to reform. As far as I'm concerned, the reform the NHS needs to see is a national care service. We need social care to be working, and that takes loads of pressure out of the system. But as well as taking pressure out of the system, it is way more than that. It helps people to lead fulfilling lives. It helps them to thrive. It helps them to fulfill their potential. It takes a burden off their families and their communities so that they can contribute economically, but they can also thrive. So I just think, I mean, I'm there. We just need to be doing it. We need to make these changes. There's, you know, and if we care enough, we can do it. Yeah. If we care enough, we can do it. I was thinking as the others were speaking about the National Care Service, so what does that offer us? So one thing it offers us is that ability to look all over the country, take our heads up and think, actually things are different. So I live in Highland. In Highland, the delayed, and I know all these numbers because we're so working hard all the time with it. So in Highland, the rate of delayed discharge is 109 per 100,000 people. In East Ayrshire, the rate is 13 per 100,000 people. And what East Ayrshire has is a really integrated health and social care system where people literally leave their egos at the door, sit round a table and deliver for their citizens. We need that to happen in every part of the country. There are structural challenges, so I know Highland has real challenges. The geography is against us, the topography, the sparseness of population, all of these things are hard, but actually, I didn't realise until I got elected that Highland has a different model of education to everyone else in the country. And that is probably part of the explanation why things are so hard there. So things are really hard in Highland, but not so challenging in Argyll and Butte, where they also have the same geography, topography, sparseness of population, competition with hospitality for labour market, all of these things. So what a national care service offers us is that opportunity for leaders within each part of the country to sit round a table and to think, this is how it is in my area, how is it in your area, and what can I learn from you to do things better? For the third sector organisations, it gives us a chance. Like I go to the most amazing projects and actually two of them were dementia communities. And like I say, I, w I went into Kirimuir and had a sing-along. <laughs> and I went into, into Prestwick and they went one better and had me dancing. It was mm. phenomenal. And you think, why can't this happen in every part of the country? Why can't we do this everywhere? Why are we only doing this in this one tiny part of the country? And I've met that in many, many different, you know, so it's not just dementia communities, perinatal mental health, all of those things. And I think the, the trouble is that each of these third sector organisations, having persuaded one local authority to give it a try, got it working, made this magical life transforming stuff happen in one part of the country, then they have to go and persuade the other 31 to take it on as well. And I just think we could do that a bit better. I think we could, I am, and I am somebody who, I mean, I live in the rural West Highlands. I know that one size does not fit all. I know that social care can't look the same in Ullapo, where I live, as it looks even in Inverness, never mind Edinburgh. But we can do a bit better. We can learn from each other. If we care enough, we can get it right for everyone. And I really think we need to crack on and start doing that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, one of the things that, that I think all, probably all of us here will have talked to the Scottish Government out in different ways across the year is about how important connections and care are and how important a connected approach to, to delivering the change you want to see that absolutely putting people right and their families right in the heart of that. So maybe, Professor Gibbs, I can come to you again. How can we make all the different parts of the system, whether it's social work, primary care, justice, community health, how can we get all these systems working better together? Um, there's the top, there's the middle, and then there's the front line, isn't there? And they all need uh, slightly different things. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to the front line, to think about that particularly, uh, you, you can't get away from one of the key things that hasn't yet happened that does still have to happen, which is money and pay. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of 
fair and decent work, and that means multiple things, but it really does mean pay. And it, it concerns me greatly that the direction of travel is a greater distance between the social care part of the workforce and local authorities and the NHS. So instead of this, that part of the system for the front line coming together, it's, it's getting worse, I think, and uh, um, uh, th that needs to change. Uh, the middle of the system is stuck with things like commissioning and procurement systems and procedures and policies that uh, are not uh, very friendly and uh, if effective. So that middle part of the system... Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and, sorry? There's, there's all parts of the elements of the detail of the system as well as the general procedures. It's just not working, and that, that middle part really has to change. And uh, at, the, uh, at the top at the moment, I mean, I, you know, I'm very impressed with, with Marie uh, in terms of all the conversations that we've had privately as, as well as, as here. But, but I do know it's immensely frustrating, particularly for you know, third sector and, and other organisations, to see what's going on between... I described it over lunch with somebody else as Godzilla versus King Kong um, as, as being which what was happening. <laughs> you can self-identify whichever way. It's, uh, it's okay. Um, so, you know, but, but, but we do need to get beyond that. And it, it is difficult because politics is politics and you are where you are in the cycle. But it's immensely frustrating for everybody that, you know, to have got this far with implementing something is now not hitting these kinds of challenges and and problems, and as I say, I know your people can go to the stalls and see the different work that's been done by the different parts of the uh, Scottish government teams who are working immensely hard and diligently on all kinds of different levels of detail. So, you know, fix the uh, fix the battles, get those kind of intermediate level system things right, pay people more consistently, and integrate the workforce properly in terms of training and, and other things. If we can do those things, the world is ours. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I guess, I mean, I think, Marion, as you're the person and with Laura who are really living this day to day, how does that feel for you? And w would you have anything to add to that? Um, just that there's a lot of stuff there that I don't really understand, and I, I don't understand how all that works in these different layers. I don't like hearing about layers that maybe they have to exist, and somebody could explain that to me. And you, we're experts on the, the, the end result then, aren't we? And I, I think that if, um, if all of those people that you were talking about, all the people in the different layers and the people having to work together, again, going back to that care enough, see if each, they're all different individuals uh, with a job, and if each of those job roles was about caring enough to get it right, and bearing that in mind whenever you are um, managing a, a service or plant or whatever, um, I would say... If everyone could keep the focus on what this is really all about, mm -hmm. it's about the person and their families. And um, remember why you're doing what you're doing. Always be keeping that in your mind. Never forget that, that the person who's going to benefit from you doing a really good job. Um, I would say get rid of the them and us culture. Or can we not all just be us? Because we really all want the same thing. Don't all these people that you're talking about and um, everyone uh, wants the same thing so I think that's what I would say um, and another example I love giving examples so people can understand kind of from our experience anyway I remember when uh, Laura needed a, a special mattress so she needs a pressure relieving mattress because her skin is very vulnerable um, and uh, Health were saying that social care that should fund that, and social care was saying it should, it's health. And while we were arguing about it, we had known we didn't get the mattress. Um, that's no good enough, is it? Because if they were caring enough, they'd say, "Well, let's let's get it, and then we'll argue about who's going to fund this." But but Laura had to do without, and then I, I just happened to be at a, yeah, another meeting um, at where there was a social work manager there, so I was able to spat stand up and say that Laura's waiting for this mattress while well, health and social work uh, are good out and two days later she got her mattress but it shouldn't take that sh you know if I hadn't been at the, ma the meeting I don't know what that so that kind of thing we need to they need to talk together don't they um, I, I, I also heard 
uh, I've got a, a lady who has loads of equipment in her house because she got a piece of equipment and then after a wee while she didn't need that but she needed something else and that happened a few times so I was told that she has all this equipment in her hall and because they're not joining up and it, it, it wasn't organised for it, the, the piece of equipment that wasn't needed didn't get picked up and that could be going to somebody else that needs it. But also we were dead aware that this woman might, she's probably going to trip over this blooming equipment and then we'll have another problem as well. So just all of these things, I know they sound pretty basic and that it's common sense, but they're really important, sure they? Yeah. Right, and I, I said, as ever, when you start a panel discussion, the, the, the questions zoom past, and before you know it, you're, you're really um, getting near to, the, near to the end of the discussion. But I think it's probably now, when we think about all the things we've talked about, we think about people who are, who are really struggling to get their voice heard and the experiences that better collaboration might provide opportunities for them, thinking about the leadership and the culture that we need to push and deliver and change. We need to think about the really significant barriers that what space it still exists between NHS, local authorities, social care, and how we how we break down those barriers and think about keeping the people we're all trying to work with and work alongside and, and really give people fantastic quality of life, like they may be having if they come along to a meeting centre on a Tuesday morning, whatever. There's a lot to do. And I guess, Marie, I'm probably going to come to you to ask about the board itself that will be looking to this. And, and if we, we, ha we know that we have a National Care Service board as part of the proposals, and we know that its purpose is to be to be make sure that services are fair and consistent. We've heard so much about lack of consistency across across the country today and I, I'm particularly feeling for NHS Highland today <laughs> who have heard, heard, heard a lot about there but I know that in other places too we hear some good examples and some really challenging practice too so um, but we know too that human rights is meant to go right to the heart of that decision making and, and developing standards and identifying good practice and taking on that accountability. Mm. Marie how is it going to work how are we going to know it's working? I mean, I guess to pick out NHS Highland again, just to be to reassure the room, they are determined to to make things better, and actually that shows you one of the things that this national board would offer is where things are really challenging, where there are that combination of national challenges and local challenges overlaid. This would be a system of support for those geographical areas to access and there's huge levels of effort going in to improve the situation in Highland and they are, they are really willing to change actually and to, to make those changes very realistic about how hard it's going to be and how challenging it would be. Change is not easy, we all know that, um, but actually they have that opportunity and we have that because of all the focus on delayed discharges we have that opportunity to, to, you know, we're meeting weekly at the moment, these CRAG meetings, and the areas that have the furthest to come are seeking and getting that individual support. So that's one of the things that I would expect a National Care Service Board to offer. I would expect there to be more accountability. So we've heard it in this room today, when people hear stories, and you said it, Marion, as well, that you stood up at a conference and mentioned that your daughter was needing this mattress and that social care and healthcare were fighting about it. In the meantime, she didn't have the mattress. And actually just hearing that story precipitated the change that you needed to see. And I think we have that opportunity because we're going to have lived experience right at that table. So those people with the powerful stories of what it's like to access social care, what it's like to work in social care will be there around that table. I think one of the jewels in the crown of the National Care Service Board will be the National Social Work Agency. I think it is crying out for a national approach to social work in this country. We need that cohesive approach. We need to set national standards. We need to give social workers um, the security of knowing what it is they are meant to do and knowing that they will be trusted to do that, and I, I always talk about it. I mean, I, I um, love social workers, I've, and I know that that won't be a popular view with everyone in this room, but I have worked with them for a very, very long time. They are social justice warriors, mm. 
and they are absolutely vital to the system working well because it, they are the ones who make sure that human rights are upheld within the system. They're really important that they are empowered to do the job that we ask them of them and not worrying about budgets and not worrying about all the other things that they have to worry about every day. I think we've a real opportunity with that National Care Service Board to deliver that, to put social work at the heart of it, to set some national standards, to set some national workforce planning that will really help to hold up that profession and make the whole system work better. I think people tell me all the time they want ministers to be accountable. People told Derek Feely that. People said during the pandemic, we want our government to be accountable for social care in Scotland. And at the moment, we aren't. And, and I feel that that, you know, initially, our first proposal for a national care service was for us to seize all of the power and all of the responsibility and all of the assets and do it. Um, now, that was not palatable. When I came into this job, um, everybody was against the National Care Service and COSLA and the unions in particular were very strongly against, and that's where that tripartite agreement came from. And I think it's really important that you have that shared accountability. I actually believe in it that there needs to be national accountability from ministers and local accountability from the NHS and from local authorities. And together you can deliver that accountable system that, that delivers high quality social care everywhere, that people can access the care that they need, the care that they have a right to um, in every part of our country. And I think it is absolutely vital. So I see that board as being really, really important. It will be you know, a little further down the line before we settle out exactly who is around the table. And, and it, it's a co, you know, it's not me that dictates it, although I'm, t I'm tempted. Yes. <laughs> I'm tempted to say, if you won't work with me, I'll just do it in a way and I'll do it my way. Um, <laughs> but it is, um, I think, really important for us to work together to get it right. And I, then I think, and as I say, I go back to that, you know, going into that room in East Ayrshire, and that, you know, they're not perfect. Everybody has their challenges, and I'm sure there are people living in East Ayrshire who can tell me stories that illustrate when that system let them down. But, oh my goodness, what I saw in that room was literally everyone, egos at the door, round a table, saying, how can we work together to deliver for these individual citizens who need us. And I think we have a real opportunity with the National Care Service Board to do that. The local boards will be, you know, delivering, um, they'll, they'll produce um, plans that will be scrutinized by that national board. So instead of me scrutinizing it, as, which is what is happening at the moment through CRAG. Ministers are all over what's happening on delayed discharges in the areas that are needing more help. I think it's really important to get that system of support right, to get the right voices around the table, to hold the system to account, not just a top-down thing, but to be able to have the voices there that say, well, while you guys, while health and social care are arguing about that mattress, my daughter is developing sores. Mm and just get us right back to how do we how do we make this work for people rather than all the reasons that it can't work. Yeah, thank you. And just before we close the panel discussion, I think it'd be great to hear just really quickly from everybody, if Care Service goes forward, James, what improvements would you like to see over the next few years? I think just kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, we, we need to see a service that is delivering for everyone right now it's, it's it's a patchwork it's it's good in some places it's not so good in other areas there's a lot of challenges that will need to be overcome uh, but fundamentally you know we need to see significant improvements in social care and you know it, it will have a fundamentally a huge impact in the fabric of our country if we do yeah graham um, yeah 
scratch that you, you were raising, but there used to be about that equality of support, um, you know, you need to be seeing um, th the same level of support for everybody, wherever you are in Scotland. Um, and I think a key part of that will be fixing SDS. If we can get SDS right, then people will be able to access the support they need when they need it. Yeah, thank you. And Marion, if it's all right, I'm going to come to you last. I think you deserve to come to get the final word, I think, from your personal experience today. Uh, Professor Gibb. I think yeah. the biggest thing, obviously, is leadership at the top getting together again. And, you know, you, 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 you've heard quite a lot about that today. That's really important. And that's immediate and short term. Longer term, you do need to change the culture. And that's the culture of Scotland. That's the culture of integration. That's the culture of local authorities and the NHS and community health and social work. That takes time. And you've got to win hearts and get people enthusiastically engaged in that. And yeah. we're not there at the moment, but I think people understand that and are working towards it. So we can do more on that. Minister, I'll give you a really brief word because <laughs> you're getting another go at the end and then I'll come to you, Mary. So, I mean, I, I guess we have an opportunity to really change things in Scotland and, and we have an opportunity. So I, I think regularly... Globally, social care is seen as a drain, and actually it's an investment, just as you said, James. It's an investment in our society. It's an investment in our communities. It's an investment in our families. And each and every single one of us, whether we know it or not, has a vested interest in that. Um, I know that people want this system to work. It is an investment. I just need to persuade every one of that. <laughs> and Marion, from all of this work, what improvements do you think yourself, Laura, your family would like to see? I think the biggest change I'd like to see is attitudes. And so that someone who has a social care need, that need isn't frowned upon or, or have a negative attitude towards it. Um, just like I, I, I wouldn't be embarrassed going to my doctor and saying I've, I've hurt my finger or something. I don't want to be embarrassed saying that I have a social care need. So that attitude thing, if yeah. that changed, I think that would help a lot. Great, thank you. And I think a big thank you to everybody on our panel this afternoon for exploring some of the themes from this morning. So now there's so many in the room today, and I know from the conversations you've had, you'll have more to talk about. So we've got the opportunity now till, till three o'clock, just after three, um, to go back into your groups on your tables, work with your facilitators and note takers to share some reflections. And all of that will feed back into Scottish Government to support policy direction going forward. And we'll pick up again at three. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.
How's everybody doing? Think it's time to regroup for the last hurrah? Hope everybody online's had a chance to have a conversation. Maybe get a small comfort break as well. Just going to draw us back together. Um, and see you. Thank you once again to everybody who came and sat on our panel and our panel and shared their thoughts and experiences. It's absolutely clear. I love the way this morning when I started speaking, you all stopped talking immediately, but clearly the day has heated up the conversations which seem to be continuing on. So I think I'm quite happy. I'll continue here. You carry on with your conversations, but no. Thanks so much. I hope you found that last 20 minutes. You've had a real opportunity to get your thoughts and, and forward thinking through to the note takers and facilitators on the, in the room. Um, and that you've enjoyed the afternoon too. It's my pleasure now um, really to hand over to Marie Todd officially, the Minister for Social Care, well, Minister of Mental Wellbeing and Sport. Sorry, it's been a long afternoon and she's going to share some closing remarks with you. Marie, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Gosh, it's a, it's a sign of a good conference if at the end of the day we can't get people to stop talking. So that means that you're all hearing each other's stories, making connections, collaborating, taking ideas home. So that's a success. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone for coming along today and also to those of us who've joined us online, all 300 of you. Your time and the enthusiasm that you've brought has been absolutely invaluable. Um, I'd like to give a very special thanks to our chair, Catherine, for guiding us through the day and to our panel members. I, I must admit, I really enjoyed taking part and hearing everyone sharing their knowledge and expertise during such a dynamic discussion, but I think um, what was most powerful is that we did um, constantly keep going back to who is it we're doing this for and why is it we're doing it. And I think at tough times, like we're currently facing a wee bump in the road, I think that's really important and powerful. Um, I want to say thank you to David Duke for sharing his story with us today. I found it really inspirational, actually, to hear about what led him to set up Street soccer Scotland. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting um, one of the women's projects last week and it was a really powerful experience. It was Women and Girls in Sports Week last week, which is like the best week of my ministerial year, it has to be said. And um, they, I met these women who were in recovery, who were thriving, who were supporting each other, who were taking on leadership roles all through sport. And I just thought, what incredible, powerful work. So it helps people who are facing social exclusion, mental health issues, and it provides an inclusive space for football-inspired training and personal development. And it inspires everyone to be the best that they can, all because it's a team game, while demonstrating the importance of collaboration. So the discussions that you've all been taking in part in today are an essential part of building the case for change in social care. It highlights that actually we all have an important role to play in making this change. I'm aware that I have an important role, but each and every person in this room is part of that change. Delivering a strong and sustainable care service for Scotland's a priority for this government, and we are absolutely committed to delivering positive changes across the sector. So what have we all been up to since we met um, this time last year? Well, probably most importantly, the National Care Service Bill passed stage one in the Parliament in February, which was an absolutely momentous occasion and a really positive milestone to reach. 
Since then, we've worked with stakeholders and people with lived experience to consider the amendments. We've held co-design sessions across the country. We've set up working groups to consider, for example, through the Adult Social Care Ethical Commissioning Working Group, drafting the ethical commissioning and procurement principles. And we started to test and develop these with stakeholders and with people with lived experience. The Cabinet Secretary spoke earlier about the expert legislative advisory group that provided such an important sounding board in the stage two amendments process. And I want to echo his thanks for the time and the expertise that people in this group contributed. Reforming the social care system is a complicated process. And we expected there to be a range of views and we know that not everyone agreed on everything, but the discussion is important for a healthy and robust examination of policies. And working together, I am confident that we can make the National Care Service that meets the needs of the people of Scotland. We were delighted to share an early draft of the National Care Service Charter of rights and responsibilities with the Health and Social Care and Sport Committee in June. Now, more than 500 people have been involved in the co-design of that charter. And we are publishing all of our co-design activity and findings as we go. So the inclusive co-design on this piece of work ensured that those from seldom heard groups could share their views and make their voice heard. And it is absolutely crucial that the Charter will deliver for everyone. We'll continue co-designing the Charter through 2025 and if you haven't already been there do pop over to the Charter stall today to find out how you can get involved in the work. A workforce charter is also being developed and co-designed with people who work in social care, social work and community health and we were told by members of the workforce that this would be valuable to them. A draft workforce charter was published in September and our goal is to unify people working for different employers and give them a national identity under the National Care Service. Now our workforce team are here today with a copy of the draft charter so please if you haven't seen it already pop over to their stall and take a look. We've also made great progress on our approach to the National Care Service Board and that board will help ensure that support services are fair and consistent across the country. And the board will have human rights and lived experience at the heart of its decision making. And I'm delighted to say that we've started to co-design the details of how the board will work and some further detailed discussions on its membership. Now, in every social work forum, we hear staff and students telling us that a national approach to social work is urgently needed to reflect the complex legislation and environment that they work in. And we are working to make the National Social Work Agency a reality. We're future-proofing the social work profession providing new grants for student social workers and rolling out tailored support for the newly qualified. And together with social workers, we're developing a career, career framework that recognizes and rewards those different roles and skills across all aspects of the social work role. But while our work's ongoing to deliver a national care service, we're also working hard to develop the social care, social work and community health landscape for the here and now. Later this year, our Getting It Right for Everyone, the GERFI Pathfinders, will publish that Team Around the Person Toolkit. Now that resource was designed with people with lived experience and, and nine health and social care partnerships across Scotland. It'll support the professionals across Scotland to collaborate and to provide that more personalised way for individuals to access help and support. In April, we relaunched the Support in the Right Direction programme. 
That programme provides local independent support, advice and advocacy to help people to make informed decisions and to have access to the social care that they need. We want everyone who's accessing social care to feel confident participating in every stage of their social care journey and to be equal partners in their care decisions. Now, just last month, it's been mentioned already, we launched the Rethink um, Dementia, the anti-stigma campaign. And that shows the many practical steps we can take to help the people who are closest to us to stay well for longer. And it has been absolutely fabulous to see the posters in pharmacies, health centres, on bus stops, and across social media and TV too. I'm sure you've all seen, or I hope you've all seen the fantastic adverts. I have to say, they make me smile every time I see it. So really very good um, advert. That's the first step of many for our dementia strategy, which was developed again with the voice of lived experience right at the heart of it and COSLA. It shows the changes that we need to make for people with dementia. And I believe the National Care Service will be critical to achieve this. Another thing we've been working on is Home First. So Home First is a key part of our strategy to ensure that people can recover safely in their own home once their hospital treatment's finished. Now, there are huge benefits to recovering at home, like reducing the risk of infection, helping people to maintain their independence. And we want to ensure that patients and families understand that. So I'm really pleased to say that last week we launched the second phase of our Home First Communications campaign, which will amplify the voices of both those with lived experience and delivering Home First to tell us all about the benefits of recovering at home. And again, I look forward to seeing all of the posters and leaflets distributed in health and community care settings right across Scotland and seeing the videos online. At the heart of all of these successes has been all of you and the many others who have given their time and their expertise to the Scottish Government. It is so encouraging to see what we've achieved together over the past year to make positive changes to the sector. And as we work together towards delivering a National Care Service. The National Care Service Bill is continuing to make its way through Parliament. We're con committed to introducing the National Care Service Board before the end of this parliamentary term. I want to say thank you here today to all our volunteers, including the guest facilitators and note takers, both here and online. We're going to take away and analyse what you've told us today and what you've all discussed. It'll feed into our policy development and complement the extensive co-design and engagement that's already underway. I have to admit, I'm really heartened and delighted, delighted to see quite so many people here today. I feel very strongly we have a shared goal and that goal is to improve social care for the people of Scotland. Listening and talking with you all today, I'm reminded that we still have plenty of work to do, but only together can we drive forward the changes that we want to see. I hope you come away today knowing that you've made an impact, each and every one of you, are making an impact. And you've lent your voice and your strength to shaping the future of social, social care in Scotland. I am excited to continue working with you and to build that strong and accountable social national care service that we all want to see. So thank you.
And just a few final remarks from me before we send we send our all cells all home again. But yeah, I think for me, thank you too. I can only echo the minister's thanks to all of you for being such a big part of today and for really getting involved in the discussions and sharing your thoughts and feeding them into the to the note takers at the table and really look forward to seeing the outputs of those discussions coming forward and supporting the, in, in the development of further policies as the National Care Service work moves forward. I think um, the Minister said a few thank yous, but I'm just going to add a couple more. Thank you to the Glasgow Science Centre staff, whether it's keeping the tech going or helping keeping the water bottles filled up and keeping us lunch. That was really great. The Scottish Government too, staff too, have been a great support today and in the run-up, prepping me to be the chair for it's felt quite a daunting task. So thank you all for that, to really have appreciated it. Thank you too to um, the two ministers who've joined us today, to the Cabinet Secretary for Health this morning, Neil Gray, who spoke to us really frankly about the work that's happening and took the questions from the floor. And of course, to Marie Todd, who's, who's spoken so well this afternoon and been part of our panel. I think my finish is, for finishing remark of the day is really we've heard so much um, from Scottish Government today about the commitment to delivering this fundamental change, the fundamental change we want to see in social care for people living across Scotland. We, I guess really we're asking and looking to you now for that leadership to, to deliver that change and make it really work in the way that people want it to do. So I think we leave you with that challenge and remark and I, I thank you all again and safe home. Thank you. <laughs>